Welcome to Snowmobile Sessions Live on YouTube and your favorite podcast platforms. It's the number one destination to learn about snowmobiling, network with other sledders, and have an awesome time doing it. We'll meet other snowmobilers that share your passion and show your fan photos along the way. Snowmobile Sessions Live. Enjoy the ride. This episode of Snowmobile Sessions Live and Podcast is brought to you by Energy Power Sports. Energy Power Sports is Oakville's full-line BRP dealer with sales and service to all BRP models and so much more. Energy Power Sports always has the fun in store with a wide selection of clothing, parts, and accessories for all your power sports passions. Make Energy Power Sports your source for Can-Am off-road ATV and side-by-sides. Can-Am on-road Riker and Spider, including the sporty F3S. Sea-Doo watercraft and switch pontoon boats. And Alumacraft fishing boats powered by Mercury Marine. Put yourself on a Manitou pontoon or a widescape stand-up snowmobile. Energy Power Sports is the home for Lynx high-performance snowmobiles and Ski-Doo snowmobiles for the entire family. Do you feel the energy? Energy Power Sports, 879 Cranberry Court, Oakville, Ontario, or online at energypowersports.ca. This episode of... What are we doing here, guys? Hold on, I just got to get rid of that old billboard. Welcome aboard. We got Vince in the top corner here. I sound like a, an announcer for a wrestling ring. He's from Fever <laughs> Tail Toys on YouTube. Uh, if you haven't checked out his channel yet, please do. It's a kick-ass channel, and he's the second sexiest bald guy on YouTube. <laughs> it's yeah. hard to keep a sexy title in this panel with this mustache below me, though. I mean, that's all <laughs> kinds of sexy down there. And we got uh, we got Dave Marshall from Hurricane Performance. Welcome aboard, Dave. Well, thank you very much, and I'm feeling... A little bit funny about having a full head of hair right now. <laughs> we are like ZZ Top, you know. We got two beards and a and a Frank beard, and you're the guy with the hair, and we got two bald guys here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if they say if Vince and I puts our head together, we make an arse out of ourselves. So. <laughs> <laughs> hey, before we get into the show, I got one more announcement from our from our sponsors. Oh, that's not the announcement. I messed that one up. Here we go. Fan photos are brought to you by Fast Track Snowmobile Traction Products. Modern tracks have come a long way from tiny lugs years ago, but there's one thing they'll never do, and that's penetrate ice. If you ride trails and come across icy situations, that's where the Fast Track Stud Kits can help you. Gary, yeah, what do you like best about Fast Track Studs? Well, Gary, I like how Fast Track takes a unique approach to studying a snowmobile with only the best designs and stainless steel materials. I also like how they include free access to the template library with custom design templates for almost any snowmobile. You know what else is cool? Their Top Gun studs and airlight backers are designed to pull flush and evenly compress the track in a way other studs and backers do not. I appreciate how my idler wheels and running gear don't get beat up from the stud heads mile after mile. And Gary, you want to know what the best thing I like about Fast Track Studs? What's that? For all Snowmobile Sessions listeners, Fast Track is offering free install tools with the purchase of a stud kit. Just go to FastTrack.co, there's no K in track, that's F-A-S-T-T-R-A-C.co, make sure the install toolkit is in the cart, and use the coupon code S-N-O-W, SNOW, and that toolkit is absolutely free. That's what I like best about Fast Track Snowmobile Traction products. Whoa, there we go. So I got to thank Energy and uh, and Fast Track for their patronage. And I, I, that's what I got to do for all you guys in the, in the UP is I got to record myself saying the names of the Wisconsin cities. And then and then I won't have to read it. I can just sit back and have a sip of, sip of beer while it's rolling. Right? <laughs> that's, that's the way to do it. You want to know who, you want to know who's in the house? 
we got Paul W. He says, hey, now, Pro Polaris Rob says, good evening, everyone. Corey Brock is in the house. Hey, fellas, Renegade X, of course. Evening, evening guys. Uh, Pro Polaris Rob. Wisco Sledhead, what's up, fellas? Uh, Dominator, hey, guys. Uh, who else is in here? Uh, Nunzio, he's in here. How's your head, Nunzio? I heard, uh, I heard about a little uh, incident you had. Skidoo 600 R's back in town. Dan B. Jeff Brown's checking in from Tucson, Arizona tonight. He says, great show. Yeah. Nice. Gary hired another Gary for the fast track ad. Mike Gooley said, hey, did I miss a cool intro? Yes, you did. And Corey Jinx, Skidoo Ambassadors in the house. But yeah. Yeah, that's Getaway Gary he was talking to Gary today. So we had two Garys in the house. So anyway, back at the, this isn't about me. It's about you guys. So Vince, tell us a bit about just a, just a <clears throat> soapbox about yourself. And what are you riding these days? Um, yeah, so I'm Vince Roy. I have a uh, YouTube channel of my own. It's called uh, Beaver Tail Toys. Uh, just started it late last winter. Basically had spring check two uh, special sleds last season and was waiting for delivery on those to start the channel. So the, the first sled that I received last season was late in January and um, it was the Lynx Rave. Um, so that was sled number one. And then a few short weeks after that, I got the mock Z. Um, and then that's, that's how the, uh, the connection with Dave, uh, came about it was definitely with that sled. So then the, the links, I rode the links all season, made a bunch of videos, um, comparing the mock and the links. Um, also some videos with the links on its own. And then at the end of the season, ended up giving it away to uh, one of the viewers. Um, so it's a gentleman called Julian that uh, that won it. Um, so now that leaves me with one sled for this season. So I once again spring spring checked some sleds. Um, I actually spring checked three sleds wow. last season. Yeah. yeah. So I'm still gonna have the mock, and honestly. And I'm not just saying this because Dave's here. That's what I'm most anxious to ride again. Um, I had a shock blowout like shortly after I got the mod, the mods from Dave. I had a shock issue and uh, wasn't able to ride it for the last month of the season. So, um, oh no, kind of kind of left the hole there. But um, yeah, so what I what I have coming is kind of needed to replace the links. So stayed with the two stroke. So I have a a Renegade 850 XRS. Nice. Coming. Um, yeah, so it's the one with the smart shocks and the big screen. And yeah, then that's, weird. that's what I'm waiting on too. Is it? Yeah, the Renegade as yeah. well, or the MXZ? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Renegade XRS. Oh, that yeah. screen, man! I can't can't get enough of it. Troy Olson, the the Skidu ambassador, posted a video on it, and it's like, oh, I couldn't stop yeah. looking at my little 7.8 inch screen. I can't wait to see the big I, one night. I, yeah, up. agreed. Oh. You know, like I'm, yeah, I'm very much a, a techie guy, and I I love that stuff, and and uh, yeah, just just the smaller screen on the mock, which is uh, the same the same cluster that you have, is uh, yeah, I love that. So I can't can't wait for this. Yeah. So in a in a Cole's notes version, uh, you you compare the mock Z and the and the mock Z to the links Rave or Rave as the yeah, Americans yeah, want yeah, us yeah. to call it. Um, give us the Cole's notes version of that. Um, so first off, I guess I should preface by saying that I'm like 90% trail guy, right? So I think, I think that's important from, from my perspective. Um, so yeah, the, the first month I rode with the links and you know, those, those first few rides are usually pretty rough. Um, you know, the first grooming of the trails and that Lynx was money on those trails. Like it was perfect for that. You could really beat on it. Um, what else can I say? Um, it's really kind of, uh, it's raw, but also like built very tough, right? That's, mm -hmm. that's kind of how I could describe it. And then when you go to the mock, um, it's very much, much more refined, right? And then very different power characteristics. The Mach was my very first turbo sled. 
Um, so yeah, the, the noises for me, all that kind of, the best I would describe it to people was kind of like the, the Lynx was more of a dirt bike and the, the mock was kind of the, the crotch rocket, right? That's, yeah, that's kind of yeah. how I, I, I love, I love how you giggle like a school b girl when the, when the turbo blows off. It's <laughs> uh, yeah. It, like <laughs> I, it's something that I did not expect was was how much the noises come into play with the turbo sled like it's i i didn't expect that at all <laughs> what's your but thoughts yeah, on that dave <laughs> huh. well first time i heard from vince you know he called and he wanted to um get our our kit on his mock and i have to be honest and transparent i didn't know vince didn't know who Vince was, and nope. he just, you know, I, I would say well, to he's, anybody, he's no yeah. mud brats. He's no, he's no mud brats on the YouTube. <laughs> well, <laughs> so anyway, he gets down here though, and um, I'm starting to figure out who Vince is and what he does and everything, and I don't know even how to uh, how to deal with that at the time, but in the end, boy, do we have a great day, and. Uh, I watched uh, the video. It was amazing. Uh, and the giggles and the cheers and everything that, like that that you got. I don't know, but that blow off valve might have sounded all right, but the giggles sounded even better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I, I will point out, like, like, and, and kudos to you because you, you actually – the, the, Vince's video videography skills and camera work is like second to none on YouTube. And it, it kind of made me pull my old DSLR out of the bag and dust it off that I haven't used because I was sick of the focus, the focus chasing that the, the, those mm. cameras do. And I never yeah. use it. And then Vince started out and I, I always like, played around with my led lights and lighting and, stuff uh but vince does it to an art and it's like good god do i have to now compete with this <laughs> <laughs> so anyway thank you i got my camera out and I've, I've taken a new love of photography again and and uh yeah so it's uh it's one of, well, i'm still hating the i'm still hating the hunting focus but we'll get over that <laughs> <laughs> well that's super kind of you know i i appreciate those words and i guess for your viewers that that maybe don't know me the there is an episode that you know i i go spend the day at dave's shop um and i kind of film the whole process of them modifying the uh the mock and then at the end i bring it out for kind of the the first ride and then that's where the the giggles come in um yeah i mean i'm pretty sure i was giggling in the truck you know on the seven hour drive home as well but uh <laughs> you weren't eating any of his magic cookies were you or anything like that i was not aware i was not aware no maybe i should have spent an extra night is that, we got magic around here is good pizza yeah, yeah. that's right <laughs> nice you did serve that's us great. pizza for lunch yeah that was free pizza for lunch but that's awesome that's awesome so yeah well, no that good. was uh and that's that's a great video and um I, i'm really happy with it actually dave it's my most popular video so far it's the it's the most viewed so there's definitely uh oh. A lot of interest. I just checked before coming on here. I was curious, and it's at seven thousand views. So, um, nice. Yeah, job. a lot of people interested yeah. in there. Yeah, 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 for sure. <clears throat> yeah, Corey says beaver tail videos are three fires. Yeah. Oh, so, nice. That's good. Thanks, if it Corey. has a it, all terrain TV says if it has a turbo, I want even the neighbors to hear it. He says. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> coffee water yeah. beer is wondering if he's on time and ghoulies is telling him everything's okay so dave marshall uh, let's uh talk about you how, like how did you get started in in the performance world you're pretty well renowned like i've heard of you before you know before i seen the video from vince and and all kinds of stuff like that but uh how did it all start well um started i've always loved snowmobiles i gotta go way back to when i was 11 years old um there was a divorce my parents divorced and i went with my dad and to keep me entertained he bought me an old ski rule 
uh, the green one with the slopey hood. So I lived on that snowmobile. Uh, and then from there, I, you know, I had nothing but snowmobiles until I got a driver's license and a girlfriend. What size um, of engine was in that sled, Dave? What size of engine? Yeah, in the Speedo. I, I'm feeling like it was a 340 or 300 okay. or something. Yeah. They weren't anything like what snowmobiles are today. Uh, <laughs> no. So, but uh, anyhow, that was my, my early teenage years. Well, when I got a driver's license, I got cars and, and a job to support my cars, all that. And then I, you know, I've always had a love for performance. So I was racing cars, dirt track racing. I raced pro stock for a long time and, uh, and a couple of marriages later. And I met my current wife, Elaine, this is going back 20 years. Um, and my daughter, Dora, well, she had been born and I'd say for the first year of her life, we were smuggling her into the pits at the at the racetracks. Uh, and one thing about racing cars is it's competitive and you do spend all your time and all your money. And I thought, you know what, I just don't know if I want to do that anymore. So the only way to get out of it is kind of like being in the mafia. You, you got to sell it all, everything. <laughs> because it takes a long time to gear up to get into it, but you'd never do it twice. So anyway, I sold everything. I remember mowing the grass in August, thinking about my race cars gone, and what am I going to do now? And I was kind of already missing the adrenaline. So I, after my grass got all mowed, I said to my wife, I said, well, uh, I'm going to buy a snowmobile. And but this one I'm going to buy to go play with all my buddies and, you know, I'll, I'll go play for a month and a half and then I'll be back for the rest of the year. Uh, she said, well, whatever, do what you got to do. So anyway, I did, I bought a, 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 a 670 Mach 1 actually. And nice. me and my buddy were racing each other and, you know, one day he beat me, one day I'd beat him. So we were renting all the time. Uh, and then in the summertime, one, one summer he, he calls me up and he says, Hey, uh, I need you to come over to my shop. I want to show you something. So I said, all right. So he's just across a couple of country blocks. So I go over to his place on about a Wednesday in July and he says, yeah, come on into the back shop. So we go in his back shop and he had a HO 800 Blair Morgan there. Wow. He points at it specifically the 800 and he says i just wanted to show you what i'm going to kick your ass with <laughs> and and i thought man he is gonna so i i couldn't get out of there quick enough i i went from there to the local brp dealership which was skidoo dealership at the time and andy who sold him that sled i, I went up to him i said did you sell that sled to clifford he says yeah i said well i gotta buy something because my 670 is not going to do it. So, and I don't have his kind of money. So what do you got? Well, he had an old Moxie all in pieces. So I bought it and we, I started learning how to radar run with that. Uh, and I was doing it in the winter. Well, next thing you know, I've got a turbo Yamaha motor in it and I'm going, I start to figure it out. I'm going faster and well, MBSSR called me, uh, North Bay Speedrun Association. They'd heard that we'd been going kind of fast in the local, uh, you know, in our backyard. And they invited us to go up there. That was in about 2007, I think, or maybe 2006. And we never missed one until the end of MBSSR. I went to every one. Well, I, I chased my hero really at the time, Tommy McConkie. He was the guy that always won. And I remember he was going 176 or so miles an hour, 177, whatever it was, in a quarter, oh no, in uh, 2000 feet. Wow. Anyway, I'm getting close. I, I, I think I figured out how I can catch him. Then they put nitrous on their sled and they went one, 190. And I <laughs> Holy think, oh, really? smokes. Here we go again. So, Kept wrenching, kept wrenching. And finally, um, I figured I got the best out of my Mach Z with the Yamaha motor. So then I built a kind of a dragster style 
um, radar sled with a real pointed hood and billet made by Proline Performance and all. And uh, and we kept kept going, making more horsepower all the time. By this time, I'm making about seven or so hundred horsepower. Wow. And uh, I finally beat Tommy. And then, uh, but honestly, my I wanted to beat Tommy. And it took me five years to catch him. <laughs> and and it was funny how it happened. Uh, it was a real friendly thing. Me and Tommy that day, we were talking in, in the middle of it all for the races. And uh, and just the way it all laid out, um, we're friends today. Um, so awesome. I really wanted to go 200 miles an hour, though. And I had stated years before that that I wanted to go 200 miles an hour. And everybody thought I was a little nuts. And so I kept going. I kept trying to go 200 miles an hour. The best kind of nuts, Dave. (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) He's still here. He's he's still here to talk. Over 12 years, we actually did it. And that's uh, awesome. We were at 900 horsepower to do it, but we did it. Unbelievable. uh, 900 horsepower. After that pass of 203 miles an hour that I had retired from radar gun. Because I figured I lived once doing it, I'm never going to do that again. Because probably not <laughs> yeah, that. yeah. So wow. today we drag race. Uh, I because I, I think I, I don't think that adrenaline is curable. I think it's treatable, and you got to have more adrenaline to treat it. So I get my <laughs> adrenaline adrenaline at the drag strip, and we go eighth of a mile, and I get to go about 165 or 168 miles an hour for that. So wow. like in yeah. that, that, yeah. Wow. Oh, uh, well, so along the way, you know, if you're going to go that fast, you got to do something different than what everybody else is doing. That's not going that fast. So it led the way to inventing new things, right? New technology and the sleds and, and everything. Well, that those inventions, I, I soon realized that I can sell that technology. And, uh, and that's where hurricane performance really began the name hurricane dave which is kind of my nickname it was a pure joke uh i was at a radar run we were kind of an online thing looking for a trophy this is what back when i had the moxie and you know i show up at the lake and there was no specified track or anything but we're st- and at that time there was no snow the whole lake was a bottle and standing it, and it was real windy that day well, standing in the center of the lake, I kind of, you know, stuck my finger up in the air. And, well, I felt which way the wind was going. I said, well, I want to go that way. And and he said he called me a crazy hurricane. And that's where it all began. And that's, that's <laughs> been a pretty good gig ever since. Very cool. Very cool. What was, what was some of the first products you started selling, Dave? Well, the very first product were billet motor mounts for the RX-1 engine. They're round uh, and and they, they're like steel inside a rubber. Well, you know, you start putting horsepower to the clutches that wants to pull the motor forward. Um, so we made them out of aluminum and I made them on my buddy's lathe. I didn't have a machine shop at the time. So we, we just made them and then I, I had Ziploc bags and a, a photocopier. So I made up my little, my little labels on the bags and anyway uh that was the very first um we made hurricane blocks eventually to keep the engines together with the big boost and the big horsepower and everything did a lot of those um uh, honestly it was i've been sort of driven by by the demand but also maybe by the opportunities um i'm the only where I, only place I really draw the line is that I, I I only work on four strokes. I don't do anything with two strokes. Not enough strokes for me. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I, I was like, no, well known for Yamaha for many years, probably still am. But then when Yamaha and Cat kind of joined together, well, then it, it was a natural thing to kind of get known by the four stroke Cat community. And then in 2019 when um skidoo came out with the 900 days well we jumped on that uh, we've been all over that like white on rice really 
before that I worked a lot with the two like 1200s and tuning other people's turbo kits and stuff like that but uh, uh, but anyway it's uh it's been it's been a good ride really and if I die tomorrow it's been a good ride all the way up till today so, good attitude uh, it, is, does it have to be turbo or does it can it be non-turbo uh na naturally aspirated uh, four strokes oh no we i've done a lot of uh na stuff as well you know like i kind of get why somebody wouldn't want a turbo i think i would sort of justify in that maybe somewhere <laughs> in the back of my mind but uh <laughs> honestly in one sense it's way too easy to drop a four thousand dollar turbo kit on for example a viper um and and go from 130 horsepower to 193 horsepower at the flip of a switch uh yeah and that's you know four grand or something well to get that kind of horsepower naturally aspirated is not even doable we're not going to go there maybe on race gas but but to get up upwards of that of 175 horse or 180 or whatever, we got to get deep inside the engines. We got to redesign a bunch of the stuff in there. And that's my wife. Uh, I'm, I'm not here. It and it. And <laughs> it's way more expensive for all you get. But there's certain people that, that want to do that stuff like that. We do it. And yeah. Uh, Right on. Anyway, do you want to, do you want to get Remember, that? Let them know that you're in the middle of a podcast or something like that. Like, <laughs> I dare not answer it because uh, uh, that that won't go well. But. Yeah. Hey, listen, I got some house cleaning to do too. So, Wisco Sledheads. Yeah. Starts it out with four ninety nine. He says at Mudbrats, first bush light of your life will be on myself and at J Masser eight fifty. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll take you up on that. That's awesome. Might I've not be my had, first. I've bush never latte. had one of those. I've never the had bush one. latte. Yes. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna talk about what he's talking about, Vince. And you're in that area. You're gonna love it. We're gonna talk about that real soon. So you know what? Let's let's do that. Let's have a look at some photos. We get some photos from Vince. We got lots of photos from from Dave, and Dave's gonna give us a tour of his shop. He's sitting in his office and. He's going to go with that door and he's going to show us around, which is going to be really cool. So you guys want to have a look at some photos? This is where you say yes. Yay! <laughs> we'll it's kind of this. weird because I'm like, yeah, let's look at photos of me. Yay. Yeah, that's right. Well, you know what? Shame on everybody in the audience. I mean. Yeah, I know. I know. Greg sure Kelly, Rob, over, just Rob couldn't... Overholt, uh, All Terrain TV, uh, fan photo Corey Jinks. Corey Jinks has like a hundred sleds. He could send a new photo every week, you know. And this week, Gary is sad. Gary didn't have any other fan photos. I, I had one that's not even a fan photo, but it doesn't have to be a fan photo. So uh, anyway, just let me run something here, and then we're gonna uh, we're gonna get to the fan photos, and and then we'll move on with the show because it's a, it's an awesome show. Hang on. Fan photos are brought to you by Fast Track Snowmobile Traction Products. Check out FastTrack.co. There we go. So I'm just going to go here. Awesome here. And uh, what's this? A, what's this a picture of, Vince? I I'm not sure. Um, it's it's a it's a it's a young child crying. Yeah. She, why uh, why might this child be sad? Does anyone know in the chat why this child might be sad? Here's something that has because her spring check didn't come in. Yet. Yeah. Yeah. All the spring checks. Last <laughs> week we announced our our Sudbury, Ontario. You know where Sudbury is, don't you, Vince? Yeah, I've been there. Have, yeah. Yeah, we have a group ride to Sudbury, Ontario, uh, to the Sportsman's Lodge. And uh, we've got the whole main lodge booked for my friends at the Snowmobile Sessions group. And uh, I tell you what, we uh, we announced it last Monday. And I can officially say that uh, at about 4 p.m. today, they said there was one room left in the main lodge. 
Oh, and wow. then at, at 4.01 p.m. today, Greg Keller said, I booked the last room in the lodge. Wow. So Amazing. that's why that child's, we sold it out. And I'm going to say we sold it out in a day because Jim was away last week and he came in today and his phone had blown up. So it was, hmm. everything was gone. However, we still have rooms available in the tower. So if you want to, if you want to join the group and join in on this fun ride, just call Jim 705-853-4434. Um, you can tell him you're with Snowmobile Sessions. Why not? But you're gonna you're, you'll get put in the tower, and away we go. And if you're single, like if you're one, I'm not saying single, single. This isn't a dating service. Could be though, right? Um, if if you're a solo rider, then just let let Jim know, and we can always pair you up with a with another group or another room if if that's the case, and away we go we'll make sure we find a suitable companion for you and and uh and uh everybody can enjoy the fun so thank you everybody for the support like that's it blows me away it uh, it makes me so happy to see some of the new, fresh names too uh, i can't wait to to hang out with greg and Corey and jay massard 850 we got a uh, crew of yankees coming up so it's gonna be freaking awesome i can't wait i can't wait so that's why that little girl was crying you know you uh so, you ever been there to sports? Uh, I haven't. I haven't stayed. I we okay. drove through it last year, but yeah. Corey stayed there and loves it. Yeah, it's uh, that's a gem. Yeah, that's uh, that's a beauty place. I I've stayed there on sled, off sled. We've had family reunions there. It's a uh, yeah, great spot. Wow. Yeah, that's awesome. a that's a yeah, Northern you... Ontario beauty for sure. It's you know family run and yeah. 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 Jim's been great. And, uh, you know what the, uh, Larry Barrio, your friend, Larry Barrio. Yeah. He was on last week and he has, he said nothing but good things. And, uh, he might even join us for a ride for a little rip. Nice. Yeah. He, even though he's on an Arctic cat, we won't hold that against him. <laughs> Better than a Polaris. Yeah. So <laughs> this, this little meme came from Corey Brock and he said, it's just, he's a diehard skidoo guy through and through and he he sent me this he said but darn this is funny he says back in the day we only had skidoos and we walked everywhere <laughs> <laughs> so huh? anyway this picture is this video you did of this uh this is the bridge of death and where is yeah. this <laughs> where, where where is this vince um I think the first time I came across this bridge was ironically on my way to Sportsman. Um, so yeah, this is a, an abandoned railway bridge and that's crossing the Wanapate River. Um, and I, from what I, the legend says, <laughs> is what people say, <laughs> uh, that the groom trail used to go through, through here. Um, but as, as long as I've been riding as an adult, um the trail is not groomed in that section but it, it was kind of like a shortcut a uh, pretty major shortcut but yeah hmm. it's along a, an old railway abandoned railway <clears throat> section um it's very sketchy a lot <laughs> of uh those ties are missing you can't necessarily see in this photo maybe towards the very back of the track you can see but there's bir actual birch logs uh, that people have stuffed in <laughs> and yeah. it's, it's quite the scene. Um, they, so, so they've closed it this year. They've put metal gates up and they removed the first 10 or 15 feet of ties too. Yeah. So it's, it's, it really is impassable now, but um, I got to say, I was I about love... to say, we, we, yeah, we, we got this. Literally this was my last ride of the season in, in Sudbury. I was like, I need, Oh, we lost. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Come on back. I, I'm very, yeah, very grateful that I did get it when I did because, uh, yeah, it's since been closed. But, I mean, people have stolen cars, driven them on there, left them on there, lit the car on fire. Like, that's a, it's a pretty infamous bridge in the Sudbury area for sure. Yeah, yeah. We're going to take the group over to see it, but you won't be able to ride across it. But yeah. I, I just got to tell you. That people don't realize a lot of people don't realize that drones do not have sound and vince's video of this crossing the bridge 
he added in the could you could you could you could you could you the sled going across ties and it's absolute genius i love it so, so yeah so you know as a nerd like i just got chills of you noticing that because that's the type of thing that you know 98 percent of people watching the videos would never notice but yeah I, I actually spent probably close to four hours just doing sound design on that you know i think it's a sh pretty short video like a three minutes it is, it is. yeah um, it, it, it's a total it's a total waste of four hours but it wasn't unspent <laughs> on me <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh hey and, hey and where's this <laughs> Yeah, this that's is, another is this uh, Sudbury? landmark. That's, well, <laughs> no, that's not Sudbury. That's better than Sudbury. That's that's French River right there. So yes, it is. Yeah, that's uh, that's me and the fam. So me, oh, my nice. wife uh, Heather, and then uh, my two girls. Um, that's like ten minutes from from my house. Um, so that's been pretty much a staple. I think my I think my oldest, who just turned twelve was uh, six months old I think on her first ride and and we we took her took her here so and then pretty much every year since we we try and make one stop there so this was uh this was last year yeah but uh yeah I, you know you've you've got a great video um from riding that area and this bridge um it's it's super unique there's there's no other bridge like this um, I'm forgetting the stats right now, but it's it's on the plaque there if you visit it. But it's it's literally the only uh, or the the biggest what is it suspension the world's snowmobile. largest suspension snowmobile bridge, yeah, in the world, uh, at yeah. 90 feet above the French River, and you yeah. can fit a hundred sleds across it nose to tail. Yeah, it's go. pretty wicked. Yeah. yeah, it's awesome. Winter or summer, it's great to visit. You can feel it sway a little bit when you're up there. And uh, yeah, it's cool. Yeah. I'm gonna, yeah it's we're gonna take spot. the group there too. So and look at love it. This is why she's crying. She's <laughs> she's not part of the group. She thought, oh, you know what? I'll wait till next week and call Jim at Sportsman Lodge. I'll get in for sure because no one likes Gary. And there we go. She's sad. But you know what? We might be able to find a room for her in the tower. <laughs> just call just call Jim and he'll help you out. I think you might have that same hat, Vince. Do you? <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the right colors anyway. <laughs> it, it totally is. <laughs> I will say one more thing, and this is just kind of a shout out to the French River Club. Um that that bridge is extremely expensive to maintain for the club. So if ever you do visit you will notice there's a box just just outside of the bridge on I forget on which shore, but there's a box there, a donation box, and yeah, whatever you could toss in there, that's great. Um, it's uh, yeah, I think you guys would be. I don't I don't really want to talk numbers because it's kind of out of my place to talk about here, but you you'd be blown away by the the maintenance costs on those bridges. So. Oh, for sure. Any way you can and then it, there's there's one that's. Uh, uh, miles away called the pickerel river bridge same type of construction but lower and shorter um yeah. and it was closed for a few years because of the escalating costs and the good news is they got a grant from the government now and they're going to be reopening that this season so we're going to see two of those we're going to kill two bridges with one stone and yeah. uh, it's going to be a lot of fun so it'll be good but uh yeah, you're more, you're right there, so you're more than welcome to join us, you and your wife. And we've got some uh, wives and ladies, uh, girlfriends and stuff coming with their sure. with their better halves. So um, you guys are more than welcome to join us that day too, or the, those two days or three days that we're up there. It's definitely a possibility. My uh, that's right around my wife's birthday, and that's a pretty big sledding weekend time for us. So, uh, but yeah, perfect no, for sure. That's great. Perfect. No. And then, yeah, moving on, this picture just, yeah, still, this was the two sleds I was riding last year. Um, yeah, the, the nice thing with both of these sleds was I got the two-up seats. Um, so we could we could ride two up like this with the kids, and uh, they could be comfy on the backrest, and um, yeah. Now, the Link's wheelie nice with the two-up seat on it? <laughs> yeah regardless of the seat it, it likes to have the skis up for sure yeah i can imagine it would be it'd be fun to take some newbies out on the back seat and just 
Let it let it yeah. literally let it hang, right? <laughs> yeah. It sounds like my first date with my wife, because I took her on my snowmobile on our first date and her on the back of my sled. Of course, it's an old Moxie that back then, and boy, did it like wheeling. That's all nice. I did. Never would get, get on with me ever again. I don't know why. <laughs> ah, that's funny. That's funny. She was holding on for dear life, I'm sure. No backrest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty sweet. And yeah, Vince, do your kids enjoy the, the ride? Yeah. So, yeah, my kids have been, uh, they've had a little 120 since, uh, yeah, I think, I don't know, five, six years old, they probably started. Um, so they've been riding that whole time. Uh, I guess I didn't finish earlier, but kind of on that same note, I said that I spring checked three sleds and the other two sleds were for these girls actually. So, um, Mila is my youngest one. She's the one sitting with me on that sled in the picture. She, uh, yeah, she's getting the, uh, the 200 and then, nice. uh, Nessa is getting the, the Neo plus and, Great uh, actually, yeah, I just got the call this week that the Neo was in, so we're going to pick that up shortly. Sweet, they're going to have a ball on those. I'm telling you. What yeah, are, you're she's... going for you're going for Dad of the Year. <laughs> well, there, there's a lot of help from uh, Grandma and Grandpa. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie about that one on uh, on these sleds <laughs> for them. So. Nice. But uh, yeah, no, my oldest gets her license this year, so she'll be able to actually drive on the trail. So we're looking forward to it. Oh, sweet. Yeah, that's a good time. Yeah. And again, I guess you're noticing a theme. I mean, it's, yeah, just family time for us. So this was riding on the French. Uh, she's she's driving a, I think that's a 91 or a 90 Safari L. I was going to um, say, it looks like a Safari that's yeah. awesome. So that's that's her first like full size sled that she drove uh, last year, just just out on the uh, on the river. So that's her ripping it up, and uh, it was pretty awesome. She's not necessarily necessarily known to be the speed demon, but she got on, and I was like, okay, I'll sit on with you. We'll give you, you know, let's run through the ropes, the basic stuff. And I mean, within the first two minutes, she said, okay, so how fast can I go? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you can go as fast as you feel comfortable going. <laughs> and she did. And so we had a great time. So. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. But I, ironically enough, that's uh, my wife's first uh, sled that she ever rode. So, you know, my wife and I have been riding sleds since we were 12 um as well and uh so it's kind of sentimental for for my kids to to ride that as well for the first time and that, you got to commend brp for getting back into that segment again because the safari was it's like the volkswagen beetle of snowmobiles right yeah. um, we had them we started on them or not start on but we had them and rode them and thought they were great and at 368 cc they were they were pretty they were pretty badass Right. Yeah. Like, you know what I yeah. mean? Like the 340s, the 440 was a fast sled back then, you know, so a 368 was in between and they handled really well. And, you know, so wouldn't have made Dave Marshall happy, though. It wasn't quite <laughs> fast enough. Well, not enough strokes. Not enough strokes. Yeah. Not enough yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you couldn't throw enough money at it to make it go faster. <laughs> <laughs> DP Rock but says it's still, with, 30, uh, with, with 30 people in the group, when all this crap flies out of dad's bag, we'll be able to get it all. I'm known for leaving <laughs> my zippers open. So Vince, you have, you, you have to tell your wife, you got to come on our ride just to pick stuff up. It's so the, I'll, I'll bring a fishing net. On that's the sled right, exactly. That's a good idea. <laughs> but yeah, that thing still starts first pull every time. Wow. That's wicked. Yeah. Is that one you're going to keep and keep it as for the nostalgia of it? Yeah, so that's grand, grandpa's sled, and yeah, I don't, I don't think he'll ever sell that. I don't think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And did last you see... year he put a bunch of, he bought like a part sled for it, and then uh, they put quite a bit of money into it last season, actually. So, hmm. yeah. did you say it was a ninety-one? I don't not no, probably not. It's it's maybe. It, does it have independent it's... suspension on the front, like the IFS, or is it have the no. leaf springs? It's a leafer, uh, so it's. It... 
It's no, over. yeah, it has IFS on the front. Yeah. Oh, it does. Okay, yeah. So yeah. it's probably 91, 92 kind of thing. Yeah. It's something like yeah. that. Yeah. Early yeah. 90s. They actually made mm-hmm. them with like a force. I want to say they had the 462 in it or something like that in the Safari at one point. You know, which mm-hmm. would have been a pretty cool sled to have. Interesting. But, yeah, with the IFS and my mine was a Moto Ski Mirage three, which was the same as a Safari, but it was Leaf leaf springs and it was 85 i believe i want to say it's 85 and my buddies okay. had the 85 86 safaris with the leaf springs so that was, we rode that was those your, everywhere man yeah that not was my first, first but no that was okay. my that was my first real like real sled the, the first sled was a 72 moto ski capri bogey box okay. that's yeah. one that dave marshall would have had fun with so, <laughs> with yeah. my ski rule we go throne wheeling together me and my ski rule and you on your motor ski yeah, Corey, Corey Jinx loves leaf springers. Your ski rule, the green ones, they had their tunnel, the rear shocks on the outside of the tunnel, didn't they? Yeah, I think it did. Yeah, yeah. They're pretty wild. I love that. I love that sled. Like ski rule was pretty amazing back in the day. So, yeah. But uh, yeah, so now we're into Dave Marshall's uh, photos and a lot of drag racing and stuff in here. And we'll just get Dave to talk to us a bit about what we're looking at here. I got to say one thing right off the bat. The first thing I notice is that sled's got a parachute. What the <laughs> hell? Well, that might be just that might be just like my sleds. It's the rear bag I left open. Yeah. <laughs> I opened that bag every finish line. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe I'm just practicing to ride with Dave Marshall. I, uh, you know, yeah. I just, I think I'm, I'm letting a parachute out, but I'm just letting out granola bars and camera equipment yeah you know <laughs> kind of like the santa claus parade spraying around <laughs> the, the candy yeah. yeah wow the uh the parachute thing started actually at the radar runs because somebody had the bright idea that it was safer and probably was we used it i used it for years actually as brakes make but it was violent brakes honestly when you the faster you go, the more violent it gets until I crashed in um, Michigan at the drag strip. Uh, and that was the last time I ever used a parachute. It scared the heck out of me. So I took it right off. And now wow. I don't think anybody uses parachutes anymore. You crashed really? like you to the parachute? I crashed. Yeah. The parachute deployed and it was a windy day. So the edge of the cable caught my bumper and spun the sled sideways. I was doing 171 miles an hour and uh, collided wow. with the other sled at the finish line. And we all lived. That was good. But um, messes with your head a little bit. You kind of kind of get a little nervous after a while. I bet. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. What? Well, look, uh, if you can see the skis or where the skis should be, we have a little blade there with a couple like little roller blade wheels on them what what are those wheels are they actually like a inline skate wheel are they um are are, are, what are we looking at here are they really obviously they're heavy duty but yeah they're pretty heavy duty they're they're aluminum wheels with a rubber casing on them and it's a high speed bearing in it so they're made to go they're made to spin fast everything um made by proline same company that made makes the chassis but uh uh I'd say about every third or fourth season, you gotta you gotta replace the wheels. We actually wear the rubber off of them. Mostly wears it when we turn off the drag strip, really. But they work good. Yeah. Uh, they don't actually steer very good on the on the drag strip because they skid a lot. You know, it's not like carbide runners. You know, on your on the trail and everything, where you let off the gas, it's gonna hook it and and it'll steer. These ones will slide. So you kind of got to gauge the wall a little bit. Like, uh, you know, you're heading toward the wall. You better get out of it before you get too close because you're probably going to hit it. <laughs> right. Now, do, do the drag sleds lift the, lift the front end up off the ground like a like a car, like wheelie bars, oh, yeah. that type of thing? Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a setup thing in the um, chassis. Ideally, We'd like to have probably one ski on the ground, just maybe one wheel of one ski, and the other one maybe just a little bit off the ground so that all the weight is on the track and we got a little bit of steering. Sometimes we miss on that a little bit, but most of us, I think, that are drag racing kind of figure it out and 
That's all in the shock pressure settings at the back and the limiter adjustment, similar to what's on the trails, really, in that sense, you know. Right, right. And this is, is this a Yamaha Sidewinder you're on or what, what sled are you on here? This, so I built two billet dragsters. This is the second of the two. My first one I built um, with ProLine Performance. They built the chassis and I do the power. Um, so the first one is the, my, was my speed run sled for the ice. And that's the one that went 203 miles an hour. I still have that sled. But uh, this is the one here that I drive still today on the asphalt. I've had, the, I built this one in 2013, I think. It makes about 700 and some horsepower and, uh, you know, capable of more, but I just don't know how you're going to put that more down to the asphalt. But this one was built by ProLine. He built it. He asked me what I wanted built and it was a one-off. It was kind of a prototype of the day. It's been pretty good. That's cool. And then I guess there's probably, there's not many options for traction here, right? Like what do you, the, the tracks, I mean, who's making tracks for drag? Camso is the only it. company that makes a track for the asphalt. And that is a bit of a shame. Uh, it'd be nice if there were other companies, really. We have one, one, well, there's, I guess there's three different size lengths of tracks. There's the 121 and the 128 and the 136. Yep. We run the 136. There's only one rubber compound now available. There used to be two. Uh, so honestly, quite often, a whole bunch of us, we'll treat the rubber on the tracks a little bit before we go to the races, trying to soften them up a little bit, get, get that edge, really. Everybody's always looking for the edge. A little secret oh. sauce there to pour on the yeah on the track yeah yeah and if anyone's <laughs> never seen a dragster track it's it's a slick it's yeah. uh it very the much treadmill. looks like this it look yeah <laughs> it, it looks like a it looks like a dragster slick but thin and stretched around uh, wheels it's pretty cool. yeah the other thing that we look a lot for is glue on the on the racetrack uh snowmobiles require that more yeah. so than cars. And I think because we don't really have the wrinkle walls or, or anything like that, there's a lot of footprint on the ground. But, and are uh, you, yeah. are you doing, are you doing burnouts like for heat? Yeah. Before your run? Yeah. Yeah. Good. So, good. Uh, the, Corey Jinks asked that question in the chat. Do you, do you do yeah, a smoky yeah. burnout like a super oh, yeah. 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 And that heat does matter. And sometimes it's the, it's the burn off the chemicals that we put onto the rubber to soften it. It, it'll leave an oily finish on the track. So we'll go in the burnout box and make a bunch of smoke and that just burns all that off and then we're good to go. But you don't have front brakes to, or line lock. So what do you put it up against a, a wall or a brake? Hold it back with our feet, really. Um, really? Well, and you know, the burnout box is designed to be slippery. So they, they spray a little water down on the asphalt and Often I'll just set my back axle right in the edge of the water just to give it a little bit of a slip. And you you just have, you learn to have a little faith in the sled. If you grab a handful of throttle, it's gonna spin. And then when we get it spinning, I can kind of feather the throttle to maintain the spin without going up into the rev limiter, you know? That's cool. Yeah, so I like the burn. Uh, Honestly, yeah. That for me, it's kind of a cool factor. I'm old school. I, I was a hot rodder. I, I kind of, I was the guy growing up that the cops always chased because I was doing <laughs> burnouts downtown. Love it. So the burnouts still kind of do it for me, to be honest. That's wicked. Well, that's I grew thing. up it's in a uh, very small town. So yeah, there was, there was a lot of bur burnouts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the, uh, the, our friend Ryan, who, who, uh, drag races and owns a power garage. He, he said like, and, and this, I think it was, this sled was actually on display as well as his at their, uh, at their sh open house show. And he said that it's the, the sound it's loud. Cause he goes, if I started it in here, it would break your windows. Right. Oh, like, man, yeah. like he said that the sound is amazing and how loud they are. So, um, I, I want to get to the track and see this and hear it and, and, uh, and feel the thunder, so to speak. But, uh, 
Yeah, that's pretty oh, cool. So we've got, oh. yeah, we've got two hurricane sleds here. Uh, one with the chute deployed and the other one's trying to catch up. Um, the, uh, uh, did you design the bodies on these? Are these custom to you or, or how, how does the bodies come to play on this? So, well, you'll notice, well, the two sleds, one's my radar runner in the, for the winter and one's the one I drive in the summer. I loaned the, the one sled to my friend. And uh, so he was driving. And actually, we, we used the, the winter sled sometimes to get new drivers their NHRA license. And I actually have a story about that a little bit because uh, Doug Schwartz's son, Adam, Doug's my best friend. Well, Adam, we were going to get him his NHRA license at Grand Bend Motorplex. Uh, so you're supposed to go under nine seconds in the quarter mile. Honestly, nine seconds is we giggle a little bit to, to say nine seconds with these sleds because they'll go that half throttle. <laughs> uh, so you were supposed to do part like part runs, only go half a track or go a couple hundred feet or whatever like that. And I'm standing at the starting line and Adam, he's getting ready to go. And the guy at the starting line says to me, he says, yeah, so Adam's just going to do a half run, right? And I kind of looked at him and I sort of giggled a little bit and then Adam let the let go of it and he went like an 840 uh, full pass quarter mile and I kind of look over at buddy and I said will that do so anyhow though back to your question the bodies it was really the body and the chassis is what Proline was responsible for I can tell you that the the shape of that hood is five mile an hour faster in the quarter mile than a stock apex shape i tried wow. it. really yeah i uh, almost got into trouble because of that because when i first did the body on because i used to have a stock apex um body uh on this sled on my winter sled and then i went to this body style trying to go faster and with the parachute and i was at napierville dragway in quebec and we were testing it and I didn't have the cable hooked up just right to the parachute. So I'll go to the quarter mile. It's a little short to get from the quarter mile to the turn at the end of the racetrack, especially for sleds at 160 some mile an hour. And when I pulled the parachute, I actually waited for it to deploy and it never did. So by that time I'd covered quite a bit of ground and I'm going too fast for the turn at the end. And, uh, I don't know. That might have took a couple of years off my life, but I did get the turn. I, I made the turn and it wow. didn't roll over. So, yeah. What sort of uh, like just comparable to a car? Because we're hearing these values a lot lately with electric vehicles and stuff. What's what's a zero to 60? Do you know, Dave? I don't No, I eh? yeah, uh, in seconds. You're thinking about zero yeah, yeah. six in seconds. Honestly, Vince, I don't know, but I think in terms of ET in the eighth mile, um, used to be ET in the quarter mile. Then they shortened us up because we were too fast for the quarter mile. And I, you know, currently, last fall um, at the Super Sled Shootout, and I was there to see it. In fact, I was his opponent in that race, and he beat me. But the new world record, I think, is a 436 ET wow. in the eighth mile. And it takes a lot of car. I mean, a couple or 3,000 horsepower in a car to even think about doing that. Yeah. The sleds go fast for what they are, really. Unbelievable. Yeah. Hmm. So I'm going to ask a question. Uh, uh, do you guys use that sticky traction fluid stuff? It's called stripper glitter. I haven't used that one. We have, we each have our own little formula that we use and it varies. Um, you know, there's a lot of guys using WD-40 to spray the WD-40 right on the track. That it does soften the rubber and I think that does help. Huh, and really right on. Yeah. Then there's some other um, concoctions that we all have our own little version of it you know and whatever works for us and 
you know, I think it all maybe works about the same, to be honest. But we all, it's, we're a little bit superstitious, like creatures of habit. You know, when we do a burnout, we always try to, we do, try to do the burnout the same every time. And, you know, the engine temperature needs to be the same at the starting line. And my routine at the starting line is always the same. So the traction products that I'll spray on the track will be the same takes a lot to get me to change. Hmm, right. I guess if it ain't broke, don't fix it, correct? Sometimes, yeah. But then then somebody pulls out a, set, a 436 and makes us all change. And that's what's happening <laughs> to our court because I was, I was pretty sure when he went that 436 that I could feel the earth rotate backwards under my feet at the time. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, Angelo D's in the house, and he races. Uh, he he has a drag race Mustang, so he's uh, he's right into this. What's the sixty foot time? They they uh, we just talked about that. There was another question here. Tim D Tim V from the Power Garage says, "Hey Dave, how's it going?" Hey Tim, I'm doing all right. And there was another one. Do you do ice drags, or you get into the snow at all, or is it strictly dry <laughs> land training you do? Well, so uh, I was purely a radar runner. I, I wanted just to go fast. And, and I was doing that exclusively. And then, um, you know, back in the day when they had the arm drop races, you know, uh, my, my friend Doug, well, he called me up and he says, you need to come to Cayuga Raceway, Toronto Motorsport Park. And... And he says, we're all racing up there. Back then he had an SRX, two stroke. He says, I got an arm drop race and I need you to come and see it. Well, what I didn't know at the time was that that, that was going to cost me a lot of money uh, <laughs> because next thing you know, I got to do it. And uh, I've been doing it ever since. Um, and I really do like the uh, drag racing at the drag strips. I was doing it at first just to learn more about clutching and all that for the winter. Now I do it because this is what I do. But um, our radar run sled, the winter sled, we've converted it over to snow drags. Uh, and the reason I did it was because it was, I, I kind of felt bad walking by it in the shop and it just sitting there. Uh, I was never going to radar run it again because we, we kind of did that. Um, and I, I thought at one time on a quiet evening when I walked by it, it growled at me a little bit when I walked by. So I had to do something. <laughs> but so we converted it over to snow drags and we've only ever been to one snow drag and I don't know much about it, mostly about the traction of it. So we're going to try it again this year and uh, do a little of that. Never done the grass drags much. A little too dirty for me. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it funny Isn't how it you funny? each you guys are each in your own niche. So you've got the water crossers, right? You've got the grass drags, you've got the ice drags, you've got the pavement drags and you guys probably all look at each other and think you're all nuttier than the other. Is that how it works? Or are you at the top of the food chain? I don't, I think we're all nuttier than the other, honestly. <laughs> and, and quite honestly, you're right. We all have our own little niche that we like to do. And every bit of it is as cool as the other. Uh, I would race a wheelbarrow if I could get it to go fast enough. I wouldn't <laughs> care. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I think all forms of racing is cool. Yeah, nice. Something fascinating that, that I discovered when I visited Dave's shop was that, uh, Dave, you had just went on one of your first trail rides. That's true. The week so, before I went there. Yeah. See, it, this picture right here, in blue, that's Doug Schwartz. That's my best friend. Well, and to the right of me in, in the leather suit is Michael. So Michael is Doug's son. Michael is actually the one that drove this my sled to 203 miles an hour. And, and Michael would, will be driving that sled right there that day. He is about the only person on the planet that I would allow to drive one of my sleds to the potential of what the, the sled would do kind of thing. He's that good. Um, but anyway, Michael 
uh, called me up one day last winter and he says, you know, we all got cottages up at the Muskoka's and uh, you need to, you should come up, um, spend the weekend with us. And it's in the winter. And I said, well, really, Michael, I said, you know, my business is busy that time of year and I probably can't. And uh, he didn't say too much. And Michael's like this. He doesn't say a lot. But when he says it, um, he kind of means it. So I think about a week goes by and I get a text to my phone and it's from Michael and it's a date. And that's all it was, a date. So I said to my wife at the time, I said, look at this. He's he's making me go. Uh, so <laughs> I went. I, I showed up Thursday night and we trail road a bunch of us together. Uh, we trail road Friday, Saturday, and then Sunday, part, part day, Sunday. I brought the Moxie and I brought another Moxie for Doug to drive. And that was my first trail weekend trip in my life. Uh, I had a blast and I hope to I, I hope to go up and see them guys again this year at least once, um, and I I think it's fair to say at you know as I've gotten older, um, I'm probably in the autumn of my years of racing, but I'm not through loving snowmobiles nowhere close, and I'm sure that'll be lifelong, and I I can see me venturing toward the trails more so. Um, over time yeah so love it absolutely that's yeah. cool well we'll walk him with open arms to the trail right, Vince? Yeah. you got two people here when you say the word dave we'll bring you all right that's right i'd even let you drive a two-stroke too so you can see so. <laughs> well yeah gee i don't know so uh, <laughs> you know, i showed up last winter to the muskokas and uh, I don't know anything about trail riding. So anyway, I got the Moxie and I got my uh, my snowmobile suit. I got my racing helmet, um, pair of gloves. And uh, Doug says to me, he says, you're not wearing that. I said, what are you talking about? He says, well, you'll freeze to death. And it was pretty cold. I think it was 20 below. And he says, you're going to freeze to death and you won't be able to see out of the visor anyway. So they had to loan me a helmet and a Bella Calava and everything like that. And when they did that, I was actually pretty comfortable. It was a good time, but now I, uh, I guess I got to buy a new helmet for trail and everything like that for this year. But, nice. Nice. Now you, you said, uh, he's on this gentleman's the only person that you trust to drive, drive your sled to the full potential. Cause he has the talent. W yeah. What do you need besides the ability to hang on tight and, and push your thumb all the way to the, to the, as far as it'll go? Well, to start off with, any form of snowmobiling starts um, starts slow, and then as you develop the um, uh, the instinct, you start to go faster. And and I, I I guess it's that instinct that Michael has. He knows what the sled. He knows how to handle the sled under the conditions that the sled may be under. Uh, for example, I, I've seen him, you know, as I've stood at the starting line, I've seen Michael go down the quarter mile with a, a sled. Actually, it was his um, RX-1 at the, of the day. It was 500 and some horsepower. And that poor sled was sideways as, many, as much as it went straight. But only Michael could get it to the finish line. And he'd be leaned way off the sled trying to, to keep it in play. And, and I'd be just like, oh no, he's going to die. And thinking he was going to crash, but he'd make it. And I've seen him do that a whole bunch. And he's an amazing driver. And generally speaking, I think if anybody can get it to go fast, he'll, he'll make it happen. He can generally get it to go maybe a little faster than the next guy. And, uh, and that's something to do with his instinct. There's a, there's a skill he's got there. Nice. I noticed in the background there, there's a, that's a Skidoo Rev XP and it looks like it has skis, but is that a wheel sticking through the ski? Is that what that is? Yeah. That, I remember that sled. This is a long time ago, this picture, but that sled is a Skidoo uh, XP. It's got a 1200 turbo in it. 
and the tunnel's carbon fiber on that sled. I don't know where that sled is today, but that is a asphalt setup. There are wheels on those skis. And it, it was pretty good for what it was. I don't think it was a lot of horsepower, like not big, big horsepower, but considerable. And, uh, and it went pretty good. Um, yeah, where it is now, I don't know. But um, oh, wow. that was built by Proline Performance out in uh, British Columbia, I think. And then it got yeah. sent up here. Now, was it was it one of your sleds that broke the world record this summer? Yeah, was it wasn't this summer. Um, oh, okay. We we set a new world record last fall of of a hundred and what was it? One hundred and sixty seven point eight miles an hour in the eighth mile at the drag strip. We did that at the uh, super sled shootout. Uh, that record stands. The um, and, and not to my credit, quite honestly, because I'm a speed runner at heart. That's kind of where my skills are. And um, I kind of wish maybe I could learn a little finesse at the starting line and stuff like that, maybe go a little quicker. But nobody's been able to figure out how to go as fast as I do. But I kind of like to figure out how they go as quick as they do. So uh, I'm trying to learn that a little bit as I go, I guess. But Anyway, this picture, this was, this was a special picture because I, I think that this was, that was a world record of the day. Um, and the path leading up to the 203 miles an hour, you know, you get to do 203 miles an hour one time, but you get to do a lot of these speeds and everything like that um, for, you know, it's, it's a graduated uh, thing learning how to go 203 miles an hour so there's been a lot of these runs and I remember this one I think it was a world record and it was it won Canada versus the world weekend uh, the second last year I think actually that are, that we did the MBSSR we were pretty happy about it at the time nice 192.2 miles an hour and was that in in how many feet that was in 1,320 feet. 1,320. And then the next question I have is I see that there's a young girl there with the, with leathers on. Is she, that your daughter? And is she racing? Yeah. So that's Dora. She's my daughter. And I want to tell you that I was looking at the pictures that Vince, well, that Vince was talking about snowmobiling with his family. And I was reflecting on how my family has snowmobiled. Uh, and I got a bit of a story and hopefully we got time because I'm going to tell it. When Dora was in, I think grade five, um, in the summertime, I got a call from her teacher, Mrs. Ng, and her teacher told me that Dora wasn't doing very good in school and that she had a bad attitude and that maybe she needed counseling. And and it kind of caught me by surprise. And I, I said, okay, well, uh, thanks. And I'll take it from here. So that night, um, Elaine, myself and Dora, we sat down at the dining room table. And I told Dora, I said, well, I got a call today from your teacher. Yeah. I said, well, she tells me that you're not doing very good in school. Yeah. So I said, well, you know, I, I was thinking about it. I, well, to start off with, we had never taken her to the radar runs with us. She always went to her grandparents. So I said to her, I said, well, I was thinking, how would you like to go to the radar runs with us? Okay. So I said, well, how would you like to race at the radar runs? Oh, yeah. So I said, well, I'm, I'll make you a deal. I said, I'll buy you a sled and you can race it and you give me good report cards in exchange she said okay so we shook hands on it uh and i, I called my buddy doug schwartz i had found an et 300 yamaha that had been restored and it was up in his neck of the woods and i asked him i said you know would you go look at it and if it's everything it should be buy it and i'll and bring it to the races and i'll pay you for it he said, okay. So he got there and he says, yeah, Dave, he says, you, you should buy this sled. 
It was a thousand bucks. Uh, so we bought it. It was blue and silver. And we bought Dora a blue and silver snowsuit and a helmet to match. And honestly, we let her loose. She started the kids club. She was the kid uh, at the MBSSR's radar runs. And we had to make special deals for her because she was so little. And then, you know, she would do her racing and then we could send her off the side of the racetrack and just let her go on the ice. And she had a great time. Well, part of the problem of that, you know, she's a little, so we got her a little sled, but she grew. So that meant that the sleds have to grow because I got to keep her interested in it because she was delivering on the report cards. <laughs> so we went from the ET 300 to a 485 phaser. And then we went and souped up the 485 phaser. Uh, and then um, she was doing like 78 miles an hour, stuff like that, if I remember right. And then one of the other teams came over and says, ask me if Dora could drive their sled. There was, and they had a 440 um, Skidoo, MXZ or something. I said, I don't see any reason why not. I think she can. So anyway, they were trying to get that sled to go 100 miles an hour and and it had never been that fast. And they figured Dora was little, so she maybe <laughs> was standing the table. Well, she goes over and she gets on the sled and she goes like 98 miles an hour. and and uh, I come over and I said to him, I said, uh, can I help a little bit? He says, yeah, absolutely. He says, sure. So I had a little bit of lube for the slides and we'd been using it. So I went over there and I lubed the slides and me and Dora had a little chat about the way she'd leave from, from the starting line and everything like that. And the next pass went 100.2. Wow. Well, that was great. Dora, I don't think really realized the gravity of the situation that she had done at the time. But anyway, but I realized it because now she doesn't want to go under a hundred miles an hour anymore. And I don't have <laughs> enough iron for her to do that. So one thing led to another and another buddy who was racing a sled that we built for him. But by this time he's on, she's on four strokes turbos and everything like that. Uh, she'd been, moving up is that instinct she'd been getting faster and getting faster years are going by uh she's going 155 miles an hour 160 miles an hour maybe um on our pro mod sled and then my buddy says well what do you think about dora driving my outlaw sled we'd like it to go 170 miles an hour at that time the world <laughs> record was 167 and it was a good friend of ours lisa lejeunet that had it and those leathers that Dora are wearing in that picture belong to Lise Lejeune. She handed her down uh, to Dora. And Dora did drive that sled at 170 miles an hour. She now holds, still today, that is the fastest a woman's gone in the radar lens. Awesome. Uh, That's so amazing. I want to just complete that little story by saying... When Dora graduated high school, um, it was through COVID and, and there was no graduation ceremony except a parking lot ceremony where you drove through and they handed the diploma out to the kids and stuff. And it was sort of the completion to our agreement. You know, you give me report cards, I give you a sled. So I phoned the principal of the high school and I said, you know, I told him the story and all that. And I said, well, I said, I really want her to drive through on a snowmobile and get her diploma. He says, oh, really? I love it. I think that is awesome. So we didn't drive the snowmobile. We pushed it with the golf cart the way we do at the drag strips. And, and it was the pro mod, the one that Dora was driving. And she, she accepted her diploma and her bursaries because she was uh, on her roll um, when she graduated high school and she did that on her snowmobile. And I, Amazing. That, those I are memories it. I'll always have. That's, um, I, I, again, yeah, it's just such a great story. I, I, well, I thought you were going to tell the principal, just hold the diploma about 12 feet out. And she goes, 
and grabs it. <laughs> <laughs> well, the only regret that Dora has about it, and she's told me this later, she says, I forgot to start the sled. I wanted to hear the noise. <laughs> got her to oh, fall. yeah. Anyway. Yeah. That's the moral cool. of that, though, really is truly parents, I, you know, families that play together stay together. And I've seen that by so many families at the racetrack. You know, we've, we've many years, we've pretty near lived at Grand Bend Motorplex, and there are families all over the place, and they're tight knit families. And uh, uh, anybody that wants to, to bind with their kids, want to spend that kind of time with them. You never see them come unglued. Yeah, that's wicked. Neat. And now you said she created something that you didn't, you weren't sure was a thing. Like, did she quickly have other little girls wanting to race her or little boys oh. wanting to race her? Yeah. So she created the kids club. She was the first. Well, then Claude, the owner of MBSSR, well, for starters, Dora, as she started to grow, other kids were watching her and, and then they wanted to do it. Well, that pressures the parents into buying the kids snowmobiles and that kids club by the end of MBSSR, I think that I saw a picture. There was 25 kids in the club. That's 25 Excellent. kids racing. It was the wow. biggest class of MBSSR. I thought that was cool. Vince, mm. Vince has get, already got ideas for the little 120 and 200 <laughs> Neo Plus. <laughs> yeah. I see him on Facebook Marketplace looking for leathers right now. Yeah. <laughs> In search of youth yeah. leathers. I, I just noticed the tunnel on this on this drag sled. Um, it, it looks like it's triangular shapes of aluminum or, or something that are actually kind of bonded together. Is that like it almost looks like something from the from the apollo missions or something is that uh, is that intentional for structure or what's what's your thoughts on that so um that actually is a solid piece of aluminum that whole tunnel is it made out of billet aluminum and it was machined on a cnc mill and the triangular shape is is all about strength but it, they hollowed it out to almost to a sheet metal for like to lighten it up. And it worked yeah. really well, actually it, 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 it's strong. It's still strong today and, uh, and reasonably light compared to other sleds. Hmm. Now, do, do you feel it twist underneath you when you pin it? Like, can you, can you feel the sled moving when you, uh, like as far as a tor torque goes? Oh yeah. Uh, but in, in the speed runs, you know, over the years, you learn certain things affect certain conditions and you can feel it. And it takes a little bit to figure out, well, what are you feeling? You know, like you don't know. I remember um, the one, one time it was pulling a ski and I think it was a left front ski and it would at 180 mile an hour, I'd go through the radar gun, the, the left front ski would be in, in the air. And it turned out to be soft air pressure in the shocks at the back. And then I remember another time it actually did a wheelie and it was 180 some miles an hour. Um, and both skis were in the air as it went through the radar gun. And I was trying to figure out what was going on there because I didn't think I was that, that off, far off on the setup. And somebody had videotaped it at the radar gun going by. So at the banquet, um, at the end of the, um, the day of radar running, what we did was we took that video and we screenshot by each frame. We, we looked at each frame and what it was, was the track coming down off the drivers and it would hit the ground so hard it would pull the front end of the sled off the ground. And we tightened the yeah, track and skis went back down. <laughs> but all that stuff we learned over the, over time really, and how it affects the handling of the sled and you had to learn how what was causing it honestly like uh because i mean it's kind of new frontier at the time yeah hey uh cory wants to know what year that picture was taken oh was couple, like five years ago i'm thinking it was five years ago um right on give or take a year 
Hey, and uh, and Joe Piscopo says, "Hey, Dave, it's Joe from Barry. I bought the first two forty Viper kit from you." Oh, I think <laughs> I remember Joe coming to my shop, and uh, that was we had we had that would have been our first kick of making turbo kits, like uh, marketing turbo kits and mass producing them and sending them out all over the world and that the viper was our first actual mass production hurricane turbo kit and uh and and joe would be my first 240 that was the second stage kind of thing right and sweet uh, he I, said yep that's it yeah that's yeah. Cool. um whereabouts is your shop was another question somebody had asked so god's country <laughs> 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 close to heaven is it they yeah. <laughs> you don't have so too far to go we're situated on just off shore of the saint lawrence river south of ottawa in a little town called Pre prescott actually outside of a little town called prescott in a little hamlet called domville honestly i don't know where the name domville came from it I, you know who made that but it is what it is it's about right across the country block from where i grew up so i didn't get very far uh and i'm pretty lucky here so my shop is across the road from my house my old shop was on the same property as my house so we built our new shop which i guess we'll give a tour of after a bit yeah, and sure. then in in the backyard of my shop i actually there's is the woods and I cut a path about 25 feet deep and it, it goes right onto the trail. So having that just kind of a description right on a snowmobile trail. Now you can appreciate why I call it God's country. Cause I got a pretty good setup right here. Yeah. That's sweet. Yeah. I had a comment from, uh, from, uh, I think it was dave he said yeah dan b he said smart moves reap real rewards and that's referring to the work you did with your daughter and turning her grades around and get making a passion for her as well we're i i don't you know they don't come with owner's manuals kids and you got to figure it out uh and you know i would I, I have three daughters and I would step in front of a bullet for all three of them really. But, uh, I have had the, I've been lucky enough to spend the time with more time with Dora helping her grow up than my first two. I learned my lesson and, uh, you know what? I am reaping the rewards. She's a good girl. And I, I see, well, she's in college, second year of college. She's doing well and we're real proud of her. Excellent. Excellent. This picture is Dora when she went 170 miles an hour on, on that sled right there. That sled belonged to Nick Chupit. And, uh, and that sled ultimately did go 189 mile an hour um, with uh, Nick put his own driver on it after that. But that was at that time, that was as fast as that sled had ever gone. Nice. And that's an SRX. And it's like, this is on ice and it's got uh, skis on it. Yeah, this is our uh, the rate of speed runs. Right on. That, you know what? That day, I remember that day. But so, you know, when Nick had come and asked if Dora could drive it and, and we had kind of the family meeting and, and everything at like that. Well, so then we all decided that she would. So Nick and his team took that sled up to the starting line and did what they do to prepare it. And then Dora and I, well, we're at the trailer and getting her all suited up and everything. And I remember the walk from the trailer to the sled. I want to say it was about, I don't know, 50 or 60 feet. And I was scared. Uh, you know, I'm going through with her. Well, you know, this, if this happens, this is how you react. And, and if that happens, well, don't do anything sudden and stuff like that. But I was scared. And she took that sled and it was like water off a duck's back. She just whipped <laughs> her down through there. It was a piece of cake. And when she came back with it, it was like, yeah. And, you know, um, <laughs> beyond that, the next year was tricky because 
we're coming into the winter time of the following year. And I had retired from speed running. I was still having a lot of fun with her. Well, so then I get thinking about it. We're coming into the season. So I asked her one day, I said, well, so what do you think you want to do this year? Uh, I think I'd like to go 180. And, nice. and I'm thinking to myself, oh, yeah, I don't know. So I asked Elaine, we, you know, when we were just the two of us, I said, so what do you think? Like, uh, could you handle her going 180? Like, what if something happens? Could you deal with it if she gets hurt? And then he says, I don't think I could. And I, I was thinking about it too. And I, I thought, well, man, I just don't think I could. So then I mm-hmm. sat down with Dora and I said, look, and I said, you know, we have a deal and I, I will live up to my, my end of the deal. But honestly, 180, I just can't in good conscience as your father let you do that. Not if I'm the one making the sled for it. And I already had a sled that would do it. It went 203. So I said, I, why don't we change games? Like, let's go snow drag racing or something like that. She said, no, I want to speed run. I said, well, think about it. Give, give it a couple of weeks. <laughs> so a couple of weeks go by and, uh, and I, then I come back to her and I said, well, what did you think? Yeah. She says, I really thought about it. And, uh, no, I just want to speed run. Yeah, 180 is the number. <laughs> do you want a B plus? Do you want a B plus or an or an A? Yeah, 180. No. <laughs> I, I just so I said to her, I said, "Well, I'm going to sp- I'm going to put a speed limit on you. Then, if I'm the one wrenching in, on your sled, if you take control and and do your own, I can't stop you. But if yeah. I'm doing it for you, and all you're going to do is drive, then." You're going to go about 155 miles an hour. She says, okay. And that's what she did until there was no more radio runs. Yeah. And uh, you don't want to be the one loading the, you're not, you don't want to be the one putting the load in the chamber, so to speak. Right. Well, you, I don't know that I could handle the guilt. No, I know. I know. Pretty crazy. Now talking about this, what gear do you like? It looks like she's, she has a, body armor on in this photo what gear do you need as a drag racer as a pilot or a driver for for these so i think it's fair to say in pretty well any form of community drag racing whether it's grass or ice or snow a tech vest is uh very highly recommended well because we're asphalt drag racers They require leathers, uh, full motorcycle leathers with a certain helmet, leather gloves and stuff like that. And if you look underneath that tech vest, she is wearing her leathers. It says Yamaha right on the sleeves right there. So we were doubly careful, hoping that that would save her if something happened. But uh, I think at MBSSR back in the day, if you... If you went above a certain speed, and I don't recall what that speed was, they required a tech vest. And even though she wore leathers, we we conformed to the requirement. And so we just put a tech vest over the leathers. Could that be hindering though? Could that make it a little bit more dangerous, almost like wearing a knee brace on a motocross? Like, could it could it actually make it a bit more dangerous in the in the sense that it it could limit some movement or I don't know that they do, but I don't think so. As far as your arms and legs, it doesn't. True. Uh, I honestly, I have never had a tech vest on personally to tell you for sure. But I do know that when I'm racing, um, I wear my leathers and, and my helmet and all that. And a lot of the guys will wear this uh, apparatus around your, their neck. It's a neck brace. The Lea, so the Lea brace. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I, I'm not comfortable with that. Uh, it does limit the movement of my neck. And, and I maybe someday should get comfortable. I don't know. But I don't know that this limited her all that much, in particular on that sled. Maybe if it was more of a lay down style of sled, it might. But I don't think it was the case here. Yeah. Does she name her sleds? Does she... Did she name this sled? She didn't name that sled. Uh, I don't, I think she has. 
I couldn't tell you right now off the top of my head what her names might have been. Uh, I, I know, know my daughter would. My daughter, my daughter names her cars, and she yeah. she named that led something. I don't know, but if you yeah. think of what the name was, you should text her and find out what what the name was. Pretty cool looking sled. Again, that body's custom, um, yeah. custom design. It, I, I take it they put them in the wind tunnel, do they? I don't know that they did on that sled, but I can tell you, Nick, the owner, is uh, right dead center in that picture. That's Nick's sled. He's the brains okay. behind building that sled. We did the power. He did the chassis and the body work and everything at like that. And and Nick is a very smart guy. I really like him. Uh, he's intelligent enough, though, to figure out how to get things the way he wants it. And that sled is really light. I think that that sled um, was somewhere around 400 pounds. Um, wow. Like wet. Crazy light. Which is one of the reasons I think it's so so stupid fast. We make some horsepower and all that. But, boy, you put the two together and it makes that sled. It made that sled fast. It actually looks like a it actually looks like a snowmobile too. I mean, you've yeah. got a traditional looking tunnel and the brace, the the foot rails and stuff. Like the the skid yeah. is quite a bit beefier and looks pretty killer, but um, yeah. pretty cool. So, that sled still um, goes today. That's owned by a fellow by the name of Ernie Ernie Pavetta, and he he bought it in the spring and he drag raced it in the, at the drag strips all summer long, and it. It went a 460 something. Uh, it's fast. It works good. Yeah. Wow. Hey, Greg Kelly was asking, he said, well, pondering, he said, I wonder if Dave has had many accidents and surgeries. I am the luckiest guy on the planet. So I have hit a tree tuning a, a skidoo at 100 miles an hour. I hit a tree. I flew off the sled at um, after hitting that tree, honestly, I, I flew like 30 feet, landed on the trail. And to this day, I can't figure it out because, you know, that sled hit the tree in the front bumper about six inches off center. And if I would have hit that tree, I, I'm sure to be dead by, by now. Um, but I didn't, I didn't touch that tree personally. I went through the handlebars, tore up my my uh, cartilage in here a little bit, but I recovered from all that. But I lived, and I I can't think that was anything short of a miracle. Um, why I didn't hit the tree, I, I don't understand the physics beside behind that. And then um, I crashed at 171 miles an hour and uh, at the drag strip, uh, and and lived through that. Um, that that didn't hurt me one bit physically, but it screwed me up in the head. I couldn't go fast for a couple of years. And quite honestly, at the radar runs, I mean, I had enough machinery and stuff like that. I could win all the radar runs, but I would I would just take it out, win it. And then as soon as I hit a bump, I would let off the throttle and stick it all back in the trailer again. And, I, and it took me a couple of years to get over that. And how I got over that, a, uh, a buddy by the name of Dave, Bullen, we called him Hollywood. He had a sled built by Proline to come and beat me. And uh, the day he came to beat me, he was making about 500 horsepower. And and my valve lash was a little too tight, so I couldn't turn up the boost much more than about 500 horsepower. And uh, so our horsepower was kind of equal. And I always kind of had an advantage of horsepower until that day. Always made lots of horsepower. Anyway, now it came down to the skill of clutching and suspension. And I remember there was a little bit of a roll in the ice at the radar runs. You know, when you, when you get after it from the starting line um, and you stayed on the throttle, the front, we, the front skis would lift off the ground going up over that little roll in the ice. And back in the day, I would just let off. Uh, put it in the trailer. Well, Dave was beaten. And so I remember the one pass, I hit that roll, it's wheeling in. And I remember thinking to myself, go ahead, put it on its roof. I don't care. I just got to beat him. Uh, 
And that probably was one of the most fun race, race days of the Raider runs I ever had, and I lost. He beat me by about half a mile an hour. But it took the, it fixed me. And then I was able to go fast again. And it was the competition that really did it. It was, it was fun. Hmm. Nice. Now, these sleds we're looking at here look like they're entirely different bodies and shapes. And what, is there a reason? Are they different classes or what are we yeah. looking at here? Well, the, the one in front is the one I drive, uh, my um, outlaw sled. So that's the one that um, holds the world record in the speed in the eighth mile. Uh, the one behind it, though, is a 2017 um, Sidewinder, really. We, you know, in my company, we buy sleds, do kits, sell sleds. Um, when the kits are all done, that one never got sold. That was a 2017 Sidewinder. And, and then we just made it into a Pro Mod race sled. And the pro mod class is is crazy good because you can do it without spending the whole bank. Uh, they limit the class to running stock turbo, which limits a lot of the stuff. You can do all, spend all you want in it, but it doesn't do anything. It doesn't make it go any faster because the turbo is, is the, the limiting factor. So anyway, we built that sled as a pro mod and, and we still play with that. Uh, Generally speaking, I got to look for somebody that wants to drive it. Justin, that works for me. He did it for a long time. Then he met his wife and well, that wrecked that. But uh, <laughs> uh, Blaine drives it too now uh, and stuff like that. But we're always looking for somebody to drive that pro mod because nice. I want to I develop new stuff in it. But anyway, my, <laughs> my sled that I drive though is the Ola. Nice. Perfect. They're pretty wicked looking. The turbo, the turbo intakes are massive. What are they about an eight inch port on them? It's a, uh, yeah, I think it is. I think the outside of the velocity stack is around eight inches or nine. And then the actual pipe going to the turbo is four inches. And right on. You know, that, that velocity stack pointing forward the way it does. You can't measure the gains of that in horsepower, but I can measure the how it changes the air fuel ratio. Um, so you, it leans it out. And to me, really? that has to be horsepower because it added air. And then if I add the fuel with that air, it's a comp, it's a, I mean, engines are an air pump and it's a chemical reaction that happens inside the air pump that makes power. Uh, it's air and fuel. So if I can get more air, I'll add more fuel and, and that helps. Nice. Yeah. What do you run for exhaust? Are they straight piped or you have, uh, you have cans on them or. Nope. Straight pipe for the drag racing. Yeah. Cause you, Actually, if you're sucking in like that, you got to blow it out, right? You got to blow it out. Uh, I, I, I couldn't in good conscience put a muffler on these because it would wreck the noise. Uh, I just absolutely love the sound of a 12,000 RPM engine and, uh, <laughs> even the pro mod, at, you know, like 8,000 RPM sounds good being a three cylinder, but, oh, four cylinder is so sweet at 12,000 RPM. So I like hearing it and you get to, like, I, you know, I built that sled a long time ago and you get to under you get to feel it like it you, you recognize the, the certain noises and stuff like that really and that helps yeah yeah this is your outlaw sled here yeah um so based so on a yamaha sidewinder is that is that the whole idea of it or is it totally your no. block your so this uh, the outlaw really is a based on a yamaha apex four cylinder engine and yeah over the years we learned how to make the thing strong and make a lot of horsepower and everything like that and uh it's been a development i want to say about over 15 years started with the rx1 and uh uh it just makes well, potentially we can make a thousand horsepower in that and uh, we have in fact made and delivered and survived 900 horsepower uh 
and I don't, I'm not there yet with the three cylinder. I think we can make over 700 horsepower. We're looking toward 800 horsepower now. We think we know how to make that, but uh, it's got to be done reliably. So as soon as we see a weak part, we try to figure out how to make it strong. Yeah. Wow. So this picture just, um, this was done this summer, this past summer. This was at Napierville Dragway. And I remember this picture because that day I had my grandchildren with me, my oldest daughter's kids. And man, did we have fun with them. And I was just testing stuff. The actual trailer that the sled is on is kind of like a big lever on the front of it. And it all cantilevers down and tips down so that, well, sometimes the pit roads coming back from the finish line can be rough. So um, it's hard on the front suspension on the sled. So this way that it never has to be on those roads. We kind of baby the sleds to get it back. Yeah, yeah cool. cool. How much suspension? I noticed that one sled your daughter was driving looked like it had Fox mountain bike size shocks on it. Is that all it's really? Yeah. Is, is that really it? Like you're only talking a couple inches. Uh, I guess you'd want it as stiff as possible. Is that right? Yeah. So on the rear, in the rear suspension, there are three shocks. There's a, a front, sort of middle shock, right, of the sled, front shock in the rear suspension. And, and it's, we, I'll set the air pressure in that shock just enough to offset, offset the track tension so the track doesn't collapse it. And then the rear shocks, they're set spring rate, rebound rates, they're all adjustable. They're bicycle shocks, really. Um, but they're set to transfer weight and do all the things that they're supposed to do. And then there's two shocks, one on each ski, and they're nitrogen filled. And actually, we have so much nitrogen in them, they're not even allowed to move. Um, and more, most of that is all about letting off the throttle because the G-forces, when you're on the throttle, um, want to move all the weight to the back. But when you let off the throttle, the G-forces want to move all the weight to the front. And that can upset the... That, that can create it to dart, and we don't want to do that uh, at the bigger speeds. <clears throat> so that's why they're so stiff. They don't actually move. Oh, right hmm. on. How, All Terrain TV wants to know, how different are they from an R1 bike engine? Not very much. Um, so the R1 bike engine was the foundation to the RX1 snowmobile engine. And the basic block outside of the, the transmission and everything, but the cylinder head and the basic block and all that are very similar. Um, but that is the foundation. The R1 bike engine is the foundation. Nice. And Joe, Joe C422 says, uh, how many pounds of boost do you run? Well, there's my problem because uh, I hold uh, the speed records because I like the feeling of the acceleration and the feeling of the speed, and it takes a certain amount of boost for that. So depending, depending on the uh, application, that sled in the picture runs about 36 pounds of boost by the finish line. I never turn that down. Uh, and, and that's that finesse thing I got to learn. Maybe sometimes I should learn to turn that down a little bit. Um, you know, they, they used to, well, they, they'd kind of joke at me a little bit because I'll, I'll, uh, fishtail a little bit. I'll, there'll be a little smoke coming off my track cause I'll be spinning all the way for 300 feet or something like that. And then I'll lay down a number and they all just shake their head. Oh, well, he's a speed runner, I guess. Uh, <laughs> not much of a drag racer, but when we did the, um, 203 miles an hour, we actually had turned it up to 42 pounds of boost that day. And, uh, and compared then compared to what stock, would it be? What would it be stock just for comparison sake? They're not even a boosted engine stock. They're naturally aspirated. Oh yeah. But sorry, let's, you're let, talking about, let's, yeah, let's compare it to Vince's comparison. Vince's Mog, Mog Z uh, stock is 16. Is it 18? Yeah. Well, your mock Z Vince would be about seven to 16 or 17 pound stock. Right. And your, uh, 
you know, Mark Z today are run about 22 pounds. Right. Um, a stock sidewinder, for example, runs around 10 pounds. And okay. sometimes that all this stuff is more relevant to how it's boosted. So a stock sidewinder, the cylinder heads have great big, huge intake ports. Uh, it's got a bigger turbo and big exhaust ports. So the air will flow through easier. It doesn't take as much pressure to flow that air through. Kind of like a your garden hose, you know, your, your water pressure is probably in the neighborhood of 45 pounds. And so long as you have a half inch hose, you're gonna get a certain amount of water out of that hose at 45 pounds, and they're all gonna do the same thing. But if you stick your thumb over the top of that hose, you're gonna get more pressure and less water. So it takes more pressure to get the same amount of water, same thing for for in these engines. So your Mach Z um, runs higher boost because the cylinder head ports are smaller. Um, so it takes more pressure to get the same kind of airflow as what it takes maybe in a Yamaha engine. Okay. With bigger ports, you know. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 For sure. Cool. Um, Dan B says impressive builds and impressive power. Um, back on the R1 bike engine comment, all terrain TV says, uh, so he says different cam compression at a turbo, never e really been close to a four stroke sled. Is it a triple or a four cylinder we got in there? It's a four cylinder in this one. The pro mod is the one we saw in the other picture the pro mod. It's a three cylinder. This one, these ones are a four cylinder, very similar to the R1. And he says, is everything forged? Uh, well, no, the, so in that engine, in my sled and other ones like it that I built, we take the stock block, which is aluminum and we, we bore all the, the insides all out of it on our mill here. And, and then we, we put sleeves in it made of ductile iron. Um, so that's, that makes the cylinders strong. So they don't, they, they stay round. And part of the sleeves, there's a flange at the top of the sleeves where they kind of all butt together and that supports the top of the sleeves or else the, the pulses inside there on, when it makes all that power, it'll make them jump around inside the engine, you know, so we have to support them. Um, well, so the head studs, we use the head studs not just to clamp the head to the block, but also to hold the block together. So ARP makes the head studs and, and they go all the way down to the, to the main bearing bolts. They actually crisscross the main bearing bolts. That way we're pulling the engine together using the bolts all the way from the oil pan to the valve cover. And that, that's how we, we stop from breaking the blocks from the cylinder pressure. The, 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 uh, Connecting rods in these engines are billet. They're uh, billet steel made by uh, Carrillo. Um, and then the cranks, we actually are, are changing on the cranks a little bit right now because the cranks were a stock crank that was re-welded and offset ground by a company in uh, California called Marine Cranks. And then they got re-nitrated to be hard and and rebalanced and everything at like that. So we kind of made the cranks into the stroker cranks that they are. But now that we're seeing limitations of them, we're actually in the process of making billet cranks to replace them, to get that extra, well, get up over the thousand horsepower. Uh, little stuff happens over, and that's all these weak links that we find. The wrist pins, we bend the wrist pins from to hold the pistons onto the connecting rods. We're already heavy duty wrist pins. So we're working with a, a company down by South Carolina, they're NASCAR guys. And they have the technology to make all these space age, nuclear wrist pins, whatever they do. And, and that's the new generation of our hurricane motors. We'll have those wrist pins in them. Hmm. Nice. Cool. Here's the big, big one, 203.2 mile an hour. Yeah. So, um, you know how you, you know, certain things in life are a milestone 
and here's one of them for me. Uh, my wife is, uh, well, she's supported everything I wanted to do. I remember when um, I was radar running against all my local buddies and, you know, kind of the game is it's still the competition. And I, I remember I was looking at buying another Moxie that had a stroke or a three cylinder, two stroke motor in it and stuff. I thought maybe it'd be faster. My buddy, he heard that I was interested in it. So he went and bought it. And, uh, and I was all mad at the time. And I said to my wife and my wife is the fourth one from the left. And I, I said to her, I said, you know what? I am not going to let that guy beat me. And, and without hesitation, my wife said, do what you got to do. And I went out and I bought a new wall brother suspension and I put it in the sled I had and, and it wound up beating them. Nice. So all the, all the years, the 12 years that we learned how to go 203 miles an hour took a lot of trips to the races and everything. And a lot of trips to the drag strips. There was, I don't know how many trips, a lot of them. Anyway, my wife came with me to every single one of them, still does. I uh, love it. And, and it, was, it, it became a kind of a love affair for the two of us that way, you know? I remember one time coming back from Naperville, we were testing at the drag strip. It was on our anniversary. And uh, uh, I don't know how many guys will take their wife to the drag strip for their anniversary, but I did. Um, <laughs> and it was a hard day. I remember it was a hard day. Nothing went right for us that day. And we're driving back from the drag strip. And, you know, I'm bummed out. And I said to my wife driving home, I said, well, man, sorry that this is your anniversary. She says, I would have it no other way. So I'm saying all of that to put into perspective the day that we did that 203 miles an hour. Uh, it was an emotional day for both of us. And, and my wife broke right down and cried. It was, uh, it, it just blew us away. So we kind of knew we were going to do it. Um, and if you look at that picture, uh, so Justin, the one on the far right is Justin. He's been here. He's worked for me for a long time. He drove the four wheeler to bring it back from the, the finish line. He's the, he builds the engines that we have today. And Vince, he, he really is the brains behind your ECU right now. Yep. Yeah. I got to chat with him. He's, he's actually in, in my video as well. Yeah. A little bit. Yep. Yeah. So, we'll so then there's me, Michael drove the sled, you know, remember Michael, my best friend's son. My wife there too. Um, um, another fellow there. He he was working for us at the time. He went to the races. Our daughter is there. Um, and then on the far left is Amanda. She was working for us at the time. She went to the races. My pastor was there that day. There was all kinds of people over there. Hmm. Uh, just it was. We just knew and. I don't know if you have the picture, but there is a picture. And if you get it, we'll talk about it where we were pushing the sled to the starting line and we knew what we were doing. And, uh, cool. anyway, that was a special day. That was in the memories we'll never forget. But, hmm. but you say you're pushing to the starting line. You knew what you're doing or that you were going to do it, but how, how many times is there engine failures or, or, or something goes wrong that, that, doesn't cause it to you get a bog or you know what i mean like what does that happen a lot or are teams pretty much dialed where they line up they're bringing it oh you know i didn't it wasn't always good <laughs> well they used to tease me because i always left a trail of oil <laughs> when i broke the engine block <laughs> that's in the early years because i did Every week I built a new engine. That's how I got good at building engines. Um, <laughs> until I figured out, first of all, I was getting older and I was getting, so I didn't want to build engines every week, obviously. Uh, so we had to figure out what was breaking the engines. Well, then 
when I figured out what was breaking the engines, I had to, then I could figure out how to turn up more power. And it was the kind of the evolution, you know, step by step. Well, all the way to today. So like I mentioned, we have billet crankshafts being made right now. That's the next evolution. Um, special wrist pins, because we see these weak points. Because the truth is, nowadays, when we make these engines, it's a lot of money, and it's a lot of work. Um, and, you know, my customers expect to be able to drive these engines and race these engines at the potential for years. They can't break today. And if they break, we got to dissect them, evaluate them, figure out what happened, and address it. And... And that's been the evolution of our hurricane engines through the years is we kept, we keep doing that and we always try to make them better. Um, so potentially, you, you know, when we make a 900 horsepower engine, that sled, that day, that engine went and it went at 900 horsepower, more than one run. And that engine is still together and runs today. But the, the truth is that the lifespan of the engine, if you run it at the limit, the lifespan is short. You know what the limit is. And if you're just under the limit, you're going to get away with it for a little while, but then it wears out. So what we keep doing is trying to make the, the limit higher so we can get a longer duration at the horsepower we, where we really want to run, you know? Nice. Um, a point of interest, if we go back to that picture, if you can. Yeah, sure. So the, the week before that day, um, I spent the whole week on the sled. That's all I did. And, um, little things, you can see the tailpipe and the yep. tailpipe is made. We used to, I used to have a stainless three and a half inch tailpipe that kind of came out and to the side coming off the turbo. But then I got the, the bright idea that, hey, there must be some thrust come out of the exhaust when it, everything all spools up. There's gotta be something. So I don't know how much there is. So I actually downsized the tailpipe and then made it longer and pointed it straight back. And that's what you see there. But it- So you made a jet engine basically. <laughs> Who knew? Why not? I don't know how much of that contributed, but it it all all the little things add up to big things. So, uh, it, anyway, and it looks was, so cool too. Yeah, yeah. Now, in the in the case when we when we talk about um, you know getting that limit, bumping that limit up, when you're talking something like Vince with a with a Mog Z and and he's under warranty kind of thing, is are you still talking? factory reliability and factory warranty and and all kinds of things like that where did where did hurricane fit into that oh boy so quite honestly anything on the trails on pump gas we have to pay close attention and make it bulletproof it's so important it's the most important part of the whole thing so we're very careful to find the limits and then figure out how to measure the limits and not exceed those limits because the durability always has to be there. Right. But I guess, yeah, as, as far as warranty goes, uh, I've got a YouTube channel. So, um, yeah, there's no warranty on my, uh, <laughs> on my sled anymore. <laughs> That's the thing with all the sleds that I buy to, to make our kits. I wouldn't dare ask anybody for warranty. They'd never want to treat, deal with me again. <laughs> no, that's right. That's right. And the truth but is, Vince, is that why you oh, wrap right. them, Vince, so that no one knows? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe. <clears throat> no, there's no, there's no hiding it. But yeah. Uh, yeah, no, Dave. I mean, Dave spends a lot of time making sure the that it is reliable. Like that's. That's a big thing that, that drew me to his product for sure. Well, and it's not that we don't miss sometimes. 
truthfully, um, my Mach Z had to have a piston because where, how do I figure out the limits of the engines until you hit the limit? And if, when you hit the limit, you're going to break something. Yep. So I really like to do that on my own <laughs> before yeah. I do somebody else's. The other thing too, on the same note, really, you know, the Yamaha Sidewinders and the Thundercats that we sell, I mean, we have sold thousands of flashes, but in the early years, 2017, we sold, we had three common flashes that we were selling, 240 horse, 270 horse, and 290 horse. And then the next thing I know, I got six engines that went, that broke because of the 290 horse. And they mostly were in the UP of Michigan. And, and I'm scared to death because we can't, can't have engine failures. So I fixed all their engines and you can't just keep doing that too, because you'll go broke. So what we had to do was create a method of pr protecting the engines, no matter what. And that's when we came up with the knock protection systems that we have working now. Uh, it cost me four engines on my dyno while we were writing the algorithms in the ECU for the knock protection engines or knock protection system, because I had to make them knock and they just kind of rip themselves apart, you know, so then you break it and then we'll build another one and do it again. Cost me four of them. But uh, we're proud of that because from that day till now, after thousands of hurricane flashes, we have never lost a 998 engine on, on our trail uh, flashes, not one. Wow. And I contribute that to the, those four engines that we lost for developing our knock protection. It was cheap investment, really. Hmm. Excellent. Now, do you offer warranties on your race engines? That's what All Terrain's asking? No, not on the race engines. We do offer warranty on their trail engines. So, you know, when, when we sell an ECU for the trail or we do a flash for the trail, Obviously, if you were to hurt the engine in that and take it back to the, the dealer under a warranty, they would certainly not help you. Uh, I wouldn't expect you to call the, the dealer for a warranty. I would expect you to call me and I would stand up and we would look after it because you don't buy trail kits expecting to hurt your engine. And, and we don't sell trail kits expecting for you to hurt your engine so if you do hurt your engine then we have to stand up and we work it work it out so for the race guys though most of our race you know when we're doing a race engine and all that there is a relationship that's really developed between us and the racer the owner of the of the engine that we're doing um i, I i'm thinking of my one of my Good friends, Rob Lowe, we do his engines and uh, we did a brand new engine. He'd, he'd hurt one of his engines somehow. Uh, I don't remember the particulars. It was last summer. Anyway, we built him a brand new engine. We had already kind of prepared to do so with all the machining and all that. He's gearing up for the super sled shootout. And so he, he takes it to um, Milan, Michigan, and he loses a cylinder. And he calls me up. I'm out in the motorhome with my wife. And he says, I, I got a cylinder going down. What do you want me to do? I said, park the sled. We'll look at it when you get home. Send me the engine. And it, it bent valves and did a whole bunch of stuff. And you could tell that something had gone kind of like ding, ding, ding inside on the piston and everything like that. So whatever. we, You know, I built him another new engine. Cost him nearly nothing. Just bought some parts. Um, and it turned out the, the demise of that engine was in a throttle body. The two screws that holds the throttle plate to the throttle shaft, one of the screws fell out and went into the engine. Wow. Oh, geez. Yeah. But it's a relationship thing. Um, anyway, we do what we have to do. Yeah, awesome. And good, Dave, uh, good I, I good think chat. it's worth... I think it's worth mentioning that, that Dave's continually upgrading his product as well, right? And and just off air before we came on, we were we were talking, and uh, he was telling me how he's got an update for my mock, right? 
And yeah. something that, that your viewers might not be aware of is, um, yeah, it just means that I can grab a laptop, Dave connects remotely. I plug in. They've they've set up this this plug that's easily accessible. I plug my laptop in. Dave connects remotely, and then he can upgrade my uh, my flash. And uh, maybe cool. maybe yeah, maybe you can talk to some of those uh, updates that that you've put into the to the new system since since last well, winter. So my philosophy on that. If you, everybody has a smartphone. So some people have Androids and some people have iPhones. I don't know anything about the Androids because I have an iPhone. But I do know that with an iPhone, you get software updates. Um, gotta be honest, I drive a, a electric car. That's our family car kind of thing. That's the way I can afford diesel fuel in the motorhome to go to the races. But. <laughs> My car gets software updates all the time. Why is that? Because there, it's an evolution. We keep working on it and if we keep making it better. Why shouldn't everybody have that? So let's bring that down to the Mach Z, for example. Uh, well, when they made the ECU in that Mach Z or in, in the 900R engine, they encrypted that ECU. You can't hack that. It is not hackable. We've tried. Everybody's tried, and it's not hackable. The only way to get into that ECU to reflash it is to cut it apart, change the logic chip in it that where the, the encryption is, and then glue it all back together again, and then you get to flash it. And honestly, making a flash is a lot easier than making a whole ECU because a lot of the stuff they already did for you. Now you just change some stuff to make more power and everything like that. Just kind of piggybacking instead of building something from scratch. Kind of, yeah. yeah. It, it, you're using it as a foundation and building on it. Well, with the Moxie, the 900R, you know, when we realized that we weren't going to get in and, and flash it, well, then I said, well, okay, if we can't flash that ECU, let's make our own. And so we did. Uh, that's the hard road, honestly, because you're, you're starting from nothing, and you got to make it. You got to make it, um, and it has to it has to function as the stock one does. And there's the big trick. First of all, you got to figure out that it's safe, and it has to run mint, and it has to be good on gas because it's on the trails, and and the cluster that you're looking at better look the the same or better. And the smart shocks have to work and all that. And that's a lot of CAN bus. Honestly, to interpret the CAN bus, it's kind of like getting 10 combination locks without the combination and hacking the combination locks and getting them to open. And then now that now that you got them all figured out, you get to use it. And that's like that's how you inter interpret CAN bus in a way. Well, um, we never stop. We work on this every day. Uh, that Mach Z ECU, we've been about a year and a half working on it every single day, winter and summer. We bought a Maverick X3 so that we could work on it to develop the Mach Z. Um, and so you can't work on it without making it better. Currently, we're working on the cold starts and the warm starts, that single start, first thing of the day. We've been working on that to improve upon that. And that's our newest update. We also made an eco mode because the stock ECU had an eco mode. So we wanted it to have an eco mode. We heard that from our customers, so we made it. Uh, and we wanted to be able to display the, the boost value on the cluster. So we did it. This is all upgrades or updates. And those updates are free. And, and generally speaking, that's how I spend my evenings this time of year is we you know because the days during the, well during the day of the shop it's busy the phones are ringing a couple hundred times a day i've got my staff they're all doing stuff they sometimes need some guidance i could be over welding intercoolers um whatever um 
you can't focus to do the updates and stuff like that during the day. So I tend to spend the evenings. I'll come back in the shop after dinner and we'll, we'll do it by appointments. And about every half hour, I'll do an update for somebody. Uh, there's more than a hundred ECUs out there. So these updates can keep, keep me busy, but I think it's worth it because uh, I'm in the game of developing new product. I'm not wanting to be second best in the world, or really not. And, and you can't be the best without striving to be the best and putting in the work. Um, and although maybe there's, I, I, I'm sure there's other smart people out there and everything at that, but having said all of that, that's striving for Mars. And it, I may, may or may not make it to Mars, but I'll at least make it to the moon. So I'm putting my work into it. And I am going to make it the very best product that I possibly can. And I believe that if we all do our best, it will be the best. So anyway, that's what the updates are all about. That's cool. That's yeah, really and, good. So what else did you do? Go ahead, Vince. Yeah, just, just to kind of confirm what he's saying. Like, basically, that was the only thing that I had noticed you know, and it, and it was the starting, right? So, mm -hmm. and, and you're, you're addressing it and it was never anything of concern. It was just, it wouldn't start as well as usual. Right. Oh. It was just like, and, and yeah, you explained it. It's temperature dependent, right? Well, um, we knew last year that it was a coolant compensation multiplication factor. So you're, you're timesing the fuel uh, so we're multiplying the, uh, the fuel we give it depending on the temperature that we got to start it in. It takes more gas to start it when it's cold. The other yep. thing is that in an engine, we, you know, back in the days of the old carburetors, you know, they had a primer bulb. Remember that? Well, you were squirting gas into the carburetor, raw gas, and it was basically creating a wetness inside the intake runner that give it a little something to start on well this stuff happens too in the ecus but it's done on a duty cycle a pulse anyway so we knew last winter that it was lean to start and we didn't really want to you know just give it a whole bunch of gas because i knew that if it was lean you're going to hit the button a couple of times but it will start it will start in any temperature. You just got to hit the button a couple extra times. Yeah. But if I gave it too much gas, it's going to flood. Now you're, do you're, you're done. You're going to have to change the spark plugs. Didn't want to do that to anybody. So this year, our approach is we'll start warm in the shop. <coughs> and we'll add the fuel to make it at that temperature start and idle. And... You know, you can tell the difference whether it's lean, if it stumbles lean, or if it stumbles rich. So we found the sweet spot at certain temperatures. And as our climate is changing this fall, we've been finding the sweet spot with the colder temperatures as, as we're getting colder temperatures. Okay. I can pro project certain temperatures colder than that, but that's yet to be tested. Anyway, we're down at freezing point. And, and slightly colder than that. And I can tell you that you'll, Vince, you'll notice a huge difference because it starts and idles first press of the start button. It's beautiful. Cool. The other thing that we did was we figured out a, a compensation because there was a little hunt in, in the idle quality, especially when it's cold. And now it self adapts so that it took the hunt right out of it. It might vary by 50 RPM. and and you'll notice that right away too. Cool. That's insane. And then, That's awesome. And then the inclusion of uh, eco mode is is literally like for taking it on and off the trailer. Like that's that's going to be beautiful because yeah yeah you got that two hundred and thirty horsepower and you flick the throttle trying to put it on the trailer take it off is a little little hairy. So well to put <laughs> that into perspective, yeah. I had heard from a couple of my customers. They wanted an eco mode with less horsepower, super smooth throttle. Well, so what we did was we created about 150 horsepower 
and we only give it half throttle to do so. Well, and if you think about that, with a drive-by-wire throttle, basically it's done, it's, it's programmed by cells. You get, a, you get a whole bunch of boxes in a square. And, and there may be bo 20 boxes in this square, and it's all by, by, a, by a graph, you know? Well, at 100% at throttle, you get to use the 20 boxes. But at 50% throttle, you still get to use the 20 boxes, which makes it half as more sensitive. You get to make it super smooth because you can phase it in even smoother, right. you know? Yeah. Uh, the other thing that, because our ECUs come standard with launch control. So it, it, you, you squeeze the brake and you hold the gas and it stutters and builds boost before you get to even leap. But I had heard from some customers that, you know, sometimes they, they, they kind of two hand drive it to put it in the trailer or whatever the case may be. Well, the launch control kind of gets in the way of that, right? It's sitting there, it won't move, it just stutters. So they wanted to be able to disable the launch control. So we did that through the eco mode. You know, when you're on eco mode, it doesn't have launch control. When you're on uh, standard mode, which we actually call sport mode, it has launch control and it's 230 horse and, and doing all that. And we programmed it to actually display the mode that you're in right on the cluster so that you can, there's no mistake. And it's a press of a button to change the mode, simple. Cool. What else did you do to Vince's sled? Like we're talking, you mentioned at the, at the show. So there's another video on my channel. You'll see where I interview um, Dave at the Toronto snowmobile show where they're showing in this photo here. Um, you said 35 horsepower on a Mach Z. What did you do to, to Vince's sled? Well, to make 35 horsepower, we did that through the ECU as we talked about but you can't make 35 additional horsepower to a snowmobile with a CVT clutch without calibrating the clutch to handle it. So we did that on Vince's sled as well. We figured out a clutch kit and it got the clutch kit. Well, uh, also part five horsepower of that um, 230 horsepower comes straight out of the exhaust. Uh, and I remember that. So, we modified the exhaust. So we have two ways of doing that. Uh, we changed the mid pipe. So that's the pipe between the turbo and the muffler. Um, we make, there's two versions that we have. We, Sandell makes one, it's very good. We make our own and I gotta think it's very good. If it didn't, I'd change. Uh, so that mid pipe is five horse. We can do that and run the stock muffler. And I remember the day that Vince came in with his sled uh, and he's talking about the exhaust modification and I'm talking about our mid pipe. And he was already aware that Sandell made a complete flow through exhaust, um, including the muffler. And he was really wanting that exhaust. And I'm really trying to talk him into the mid pipe because it's quieter. And he was really wanting the exhaust. And if I'm not mistaken, I think we put the mid pipe on. And then when you got it home, you took it back off and you put on the exhaust. Yeah. So the, the video, my, my first reaction is no exhaust. Correct. So I left, it was just the mid pipe. And then I said, I want to ride it like this. And then I want to switch it over and see and hear the difference. So yeah, I took I think I took it out for two rides and then put in the Sandale and uh wow, yeah, I just I fell in love all over again. Oh, yeah. You know, like yeah, right fell in on. love with the sled just for the turbo noises when I first <laughs> bought it. Then we upgraded, then it's like you fall in love again and then the noise from the muffler, it's yeah, it's not obnoxious like a two-stroke can, right? It's uh it's a deep like it's, sound. Yeah, I mean, it's a MagnaFlow. Like the muffler itself is a MagnaFlow, which is like a car yeah. muffler, right? Yeah. Um, I, and honestly, Vince, I'm, the, I'm right there with you because I just absolutely love the sound of a tuned exhaust. Yeah. Um, I'm aware, 
of the world that we have to live in though too and that in certain areas there's a big concern about that and um so we gotta cater to that but that not necessarily is my preference yeah. my preference is here in the engine and and i really don't think um you know i put a, a trail can which is considered a quiet mbrp can on my 852 stroke and I mean, that was still louder, significantly louder than the mock with yeah. the aftermarket exhaust. Like it's, it's a different sound. It's just, it's, it's not obnoxious whatsoever for, for other riders. It's mainly you on the sled. It's just got that, that rumble. That's yeah. Yeah. You're just making me miss it. I'm maybe I'll go fire it up in the garage there when I leave <laughs> just, just to hear it. It's been months since I've heard it. Uh, we should have had you we should link you up to go out there with us and fire it up with right right yeah. and then hit the two-step there shoot a couple fireballs yeah, out right. of the exhaust yeah does it shoot fire out oh yeah yeah On the no, i control? thought yeah. i th i thought when uh when um you said you modified the exhaust dave i thought you just brought it out and pointed it back and that gave you the extra jet engine no. boost out of it we uh uh, it, it's all about making it flow better, but we still put the tailpipe down. We actually try to hide the fact that we modify them to the yeah, that's right, yeah, to the law kind of thing, right? Yeah, yeah. But yeah, you pull up, it's fairly quiet. You, you, yeah. it, you, it looks like a sleeper, right? It looks stock, and yeah, yeah. That, that What's was uh, that's Dave's advice. That's what he wanted when he left. You know, he's like we we're. We, we like the, the sleeper kind of aspect of it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, yeah. I think that's smart. Right. And then your reputation as a builder too, uh, for trail, uh, performance. Well, but then I was like, I'm a YouTuber and I need to make <laughs> fun, interesting stuff and people want to see yeah, yeah <laughs> fun, true. loud sleds. Right. So yeah, for true. example, uh, the Mox E, we have a, a new exhaust system coming on the, onto the market. You guys are making it, eh? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's still, it's about two months away. I, I'm, I'm thinking we're going to actually be able to, to sell it in about two months from now. Sweet. Um, so they're just being manufactured right now. It's been two years under development, trying to get the fit and finish right. But it looks stock, but it flows like a performance muffler. And it sounds stock. And that's been a trick, but we're doing it for a reason. First of all, when, when you're on the trails and if there's police, we don't really want to give them probable cause to have, to have a look at anything. But if they do decide to look at anything, we really don't want to give them anything to look at. And that's, right. and that's kind of why we do what we do. Yeah, that's yep. cool. That's cool. What what do you think about the uh, the Thundercat you've got in this picture? What kind of gains are you are you pulling out of that? Well, this particular Thundercat has everything that Hurricane Performance offers on the trail. It has our Turbo Technics upgrade, so we make a bigger turbo for it. Um, we we did the engine in this one uh, to make it strong enough to handle it. It actually makes 375 horsepower on pump gas. 375? Uh, yes, sir. 375. <laughs> um, the, the fellow there, the second from the left, right beside my wife, that's Mark. That's his sled. He is um, very, very picky, but he wants it all. And he's kind of part of our team. Um, so... Last winter, we were out at the lake, generally speaking, in late November, early December, through to whenever we get the trails. Um, we'll go out on the ice, a bunch of us, and we'll just play on the ice on the weekends because there's no snow. Um, we have about, I want to say, twelve or 1,300 feet that we had plowed off last winter. And I was, I generally go out there with a the radar gun, and then guys will go through the radar gun, and then they'll try and get a little faster and everything. That sled right there in trail form went 149 mile an hour through the radar gun. Wow. And he hit it a bunch of times looking to go 150. And he was on his 350 horse flash. 
because we do it in bundles. It's a 330 horse, 350 and 375. You can just press a button on the on the cluster to pick his tune. And he told me that at the tri at the show, he was actually on his 350 horse flash. And I asked him, I said, well, you wanted 150. Well, why didn't you just press the button and go to 375? He said, well, because I wanted to do it on 350. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, that sled is a beautiful sled. That's cool. And I then what what size of track? What size of track on that? One thirty-six. Yeah, you know, the lug. Oh, I think it's a one-inch. Really? Yeah. Yeah. They, the the Thundercats do have a one-inch track because yeah. they they need them to spin fast, right? Well, that and that track is the R-rated track as well. So we will replace that track for. It's basically kind of like a speed track with an a trail lug. So it's got an extra couple of plies in it, okay. a belt, so that it doesn't balloon all out of shape. And it's, it's really more for safety because you shouldn't be taking a trail track really to 150 mile an hour all the time. Hmm. Yeah. 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 That's uh, pretty crazy. It's all about rotating mass. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. Here's some of the outlaw this sleds for the show. Yeah. So... You know, there's a story behind this picture. Um, this is this year at the Toronto Snow Show. Uh, this is the first Toronto Snowmobile show that we've done. I think it's been three years because of COVID. Um, we've always done the Toronto Snow Snowmobile Show for years. And as we've grown, our booths tended to grow. Uh, the, the last year before COVID, our our booth was 30 feet long and where the, the race sleds are right there, 20 feet of our booth. Well, that was somebody else's booth before COVID. Well, right. I, I wanted to have it the whole 50 feet. I wanted it from one aisle to the other aisle. So I asked them, I said, well, what do I got to do to get a booth from one aisle to the other? from aisle to aisle and and he said well you build race sleds why don't you i'll give it to you reasonably priced all you got to do is put race sleds in it so i said okay so i called up rob Lowe, who runs osdra racing association i said rob you want 20 feet to display race sleds in well sure i said we'll be right in hall one do nothing just bring a sign and br bring your sleds <laughs> So there he's got his 20 feet of, uh, that's, that, it was just, it was such a nice addition to what we were doing because it's, they're almost like everybody's art. They're personal and, and it enhanced what we were doing because we got a finger in all of them. Um, and what we were, were really trying to do this year was make a statement a little bit to say that you know, we've all collectively lived through turbulent years through COVID. And as hurricane performance goes, we're still here. We're healthy as a company and we have grown and we wanted to display our, ourselves, but I brought the whole darn staff except one. Um, and, and she's got grandkids and she'd rather be with her grandkids. So, we just brought everybody and it was kind of an outing for us together. We call that team building. Yeah. Um, go out for dinner every night We work together and everything like that. Um, Julie drinks for the most of us, um, everything, <laughs> but uh, it was, we had a great time together as, as staff and everybody that came to see us got to meet us all in person. And I think that's important. That's oh. perfect. No, it was a fun booth. I, I kept popping back there because it was such interesting uh, conversations going on. Yeah. You got a Viper Turbo here. Or is Sidewinder. It, this a, is a Sidewinder. It's a I winder. I think that's our 2017 Sidewinder, I think. It is, yeah. And it was new. Yeah. Nice. So this before is before the body before. kit and everything? What's that? So it starts like this and then you just, you, you put a, uh, you put a body kit on it and things like that. 
Yeah, I. Oh, I don't no, that that viper, or sorry, that sidewinder, uh, that belongs to Chad McCulley, lives northern Ontario. My buddy uh, Doug Swartz, he kind of the wrench behind it. Uh, Michael Swartz has been driving it, and Marshall Ball drives it sometimes too. That's a pro mod, and and we build the engines for it, and we make the power. We made the fuel injection system on that one too. Sweet. There it is again, another angle. Yep. yep. That was, I think that shot maybe is from the um, uh, Super Sled shootout this fall. And that sled, it ran pretty good. It went a 502 in the eighth mile, which we were looking for a 490 anything. And it didn't go it, but it got close. And uh, we'll get it next year, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So that's a stock-looking sled, uh, stock tunnel, and probably bulkhead and everything. Is it, or is it just yeah. some plastics uh, that's over a to stock something custom sled? Yeah, they, they nice. put a rear suspension in it, skis. It's a whole bunch of work done under the hood, a little bit, but stock plastics and everything. Is the one back there, third one, the the next one away, called Money Train? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> nice. That's an outlaw sled built by my buddy Dennis Mott, Mott Motorsports in Michigan. And uh uh and back in the day that that was um that was our world record holder sled. In fact, I think up until this year that held the world record in ET in the eighth mile. Wow. I think that's another one from Naperville. Yeah, or, someone asked earlier, where do you race? Like, where are the races? Well, what we require is um, well-prepped track, long tracks for lots of room to shut her down and, and all that. Because let's face it, these snowmobiles have one brake rotor, and it's not very big. It's not like a car. Uh, so anyway, we tend to look for the glue on the track, the preparation. Um, commonly, we're at Grand Bend Motorplex up in London, Ontario. Uh, I just love that place. And then Milan, Michigan, about three hours just on the over by Detroit. We'll go there quite often. Uh, Martin, Michigan is the super sled shootout. And then a lot of my testing is done in Naperville in Quebec because it's closest to me. It's about two hours away. But I think you'll find, generally speaking, in our area, those would be the highlights. Sometimes Toronto Motorsport Park will go there too, um, just because the glue is right. And we and, and we will pick certain weekends when we know they'll prep the track and it'll be sticky for us. Makes a difference. Another one yeah, we where got... we were, that's at Grand Bend. And, nice. Uh, yeah, we're all lined up, getting ready to go. Um, and at Grand Bend, we, well, you know, when we all pull in, because we all know each other, and um, through the internet, we talk on the phones and everything like that. Quite honestly, we all drive motorhomes, towing our trailers. And when we pull into the Grand Bend, we kind of take over a whole area in the pits. We kind of take a whole road and and then there's a class mostly dedicated for us when we're there um it we they used to be called hurricane sleds because we had the class originally and then my buddy rob took it over and now they're called the outlaw sleds and the promod sleds and uh so we, we gather when when it's our turn in the schedule and then we all run off our our sleds the track does very little to have to deal with us. Um, we don't get any prize money from the track. Um, they don't have to organize us or anything like that. We all do that. We do that internally. We pay a membership to be an OSDRA member and we have sponsors that helps with the prize money and everything like that. And we pay to play. And then it's held, it's held, you know, it's, it's all done by ourselves for ourselves. 
And, and I like to think that that's very good for the track. We pay to go to the track. We pay to, to pit there, but they don't have, there's no maintenance. Right on. You know, that picture right there, that's Justin that works for me. You've seen him in other pictures. Yeah. And, and the fellow to the right of him is, uh, his name's Willie. Um, buddy of mine, he works for, um, he's, he, he works for the union for the excavators and all that. He's a teamster. And I joke around with him actually, because, you know, I, I say, well, the teamsters logo is a, is a horse. And I say, you're about the only people that work that I can think of that can sleep while standing up. And <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Uh, we went down there to Naperville. Uh, I think this is when we went there and we were testing clutching, mostly on the ProMod, trying to figure out new stuff and all that. That's that's yeah. a lot, lot of racing is all the back behind the scenes stuff, right? Yeah, true, true. It looks like you're always learning too, or sounds like you're always learning. Yeah. This is... Uh, this is a radar run for sure up at North Bay. That's the sled that went the 203 miles an hour. Uh, can't tell you for sure that that's the day that we did it. Maybe. So will you run? Will you run that sled on pavement as well, or is it a different sled that you're running on pavement? We or do you just swap the track out on yeah. pavement as well? But not anymore. It's a different sled that I run on pavement now. That sled used to go back and forth. But, yeah, uh, yeah. That's yeah. a lot of work, though, right? Well, it's Track not just the work, and... but it's the setup. Because suspension settings and everything like that. The radar run is different than drag racing. Uh, so I you get you. it all nicely set up, and then you got to change it all. And trying to get it back, it's a process, you know? Yeah, yeah. Now, is that a battery box that this that snowmobile is plugged into? I take it there's no battery for weight savings. Actually, that no, that's the starter. So oh. for weight savings, we took the starter right off the sled, and then we made it so that we could externally start the sled. So you just hold it up to the clutch like a like an old air yeah. model airplane. Yeah, yeah. Right on. Great big that's nut cool. on the end of the clutch. I guess that's what I they know. do with drag dragsters too, right? Yeah. Dave? Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna have to get one of those for Roscoe because he's only got a pull start. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I won't carry it in my rear bag though, because I'll probably lose it halfway around the track. Yeah. <laughs> there you are. There's someone with a computer on, uh, you know, adjusting the tune, and you can get a good idea that that exhaust pipe here. If I move my mic, there we go. Yeah. Uh, that that exhaust pipe when we built that that was an experiment because we built I built that out of aluminum just to keep the weight down. I wasn't a hundred percent sure. To be honest, that we weren't going to melt it from the heat, but we didn't. So now all the exhaust pipes we do are out of aluminum. And was your wife wondering why there was no uh, air coming out of the vent in the living room? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe, but uh, <laughs> heat rises so it can come out of the vent. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It looks like you're, you're uh, my furnace pipes. Yeah, I'm getting lots of ideas here. Yeah. <laughs> we'll point it back to go faster. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this little kid's going, I want to ride now. Yeah. You can really you can really see the the point in this picture, right? Of of the bodywork. I'm talking about the front end. Yeah. And how pointy it is. Yeah. Yeah. And it's got Aaron the little air dam lip on it too. Yeah. yeah. Every little bit counts, eh, Dave? Sure does. Yeah. You know what? Going that fast, uh, it, oh, any form of successful racing was not a major accomplishment in any one thing. It's a lot of little things that added up to something. And, and I kind of think that, you know, my career up till now of racing has to, has to say the same thing. It's been a, it's been years of developing a whole bunch of little things and, and it turned out to be 
good success in the end. Yeah, that's sweet. Well, and for example, um, before we went the 203 mile an hour, like I said, I, I spent a week on the sled. Well, what was I doing for that week? Well, I was taking weight out of the sled for one thing. That's why that extra starter. But I was also making the uh, tailpipe and everything at like that. And how I took weight out of the sled, a lot of it I measured in grams. So mm. there's, I had a gram scale and I would take like hose clamps off and put thinner hose clamps off to save four or five grams. Wow. And you do that enough times, we actually took nine and a half pounds off the sled. Hmm. Wow. Those little Unreal. things matter. Yeah. You're like, I don't need this. Could you? Oh, I did need that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, what about the windshield? It looks fairly it's straight up. It looks fairly vertical. Is, is that causing a lot of drag on it or does that not really matter? Maybe there's a certain amount of that. Um, so you don't feel the wind at all driving the sled. And I like that. Um, I tried it without a windshield, to be honest. And it near blew me off the sled. Uh, I didn't like that at all. I didn't feel it was anywhere near safe. So I put that windshield on so that it would deflect the, the air around me. And, uh, and then it just seemed to work. Um, as I say, it, it, you don't feel a thing. It's not Maybe much, control. it's not much taller than, than your helmet is when you're, when you're tucked down in there, I bet. I actually think it's not as tall as the helmet. Right. Yeah. So you but still, air, you're still, you're still hitting a little bit on the helmet over top for the aerodynamic part of it. That's right. Your body, you want to get the, the air off your body, right? Yeah. 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 Um, maybe just as well. So this picture here is cool because that's Dora yeah. driving our, our 2017 Sidewinder. Um, awesome. One of her runs right there. Boy, she yeah. took that serious at the time. She was great to watch. She looks good. Uh, you know, Dora, yeah. the, Dora the Explorer. She's heard that a lot. <laughs> I bet she is. Yeah. yeah. You know, as a father. The 180 mile an hour explorer. Yeah. I had about as much fun helping her with her racing as I had racing. Oh, uh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. She looks like she's giving her. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Here's another one. So there we are at the starting line. And she's just waiting her turn. And we're there supporting her and everything like that. And we're trying to learn actually how to make that, that sled go fast. And she just did rounds. But uh, <laughs> I don't remember what we were talking about at the time, but just waiting our turn, going to go again, all that. Just usual yeah. stuff, you know, go fast, don't yeah. die. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> that, that's the idea. Yeah. This one... You know, th that's Claude. Claude is, owns the, he owned the uh, association for MBSSR. That day when, when we went the 203 miles an hour, soon as the board clicked over to 203, above the 200, there was never anybody that went more than 200 miles an hour before. And soon as it went, he ran and he unplugged it so that he could save it for the pictures and, and stuff like that. Very oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's neat. That would be pretty cool to be looking down the runway and seeing that thing change. Yeah. It was, we have a video somewhere. How is it, how is it set up during the race? Like when did you find out? Did you see it at the end? I saw it at the start. I was at the starting line, but there was a, a board at the end as well. Okay. So you could see it both ends. And because you weren't um, you weren't driving the sled for no this, for not this that one? pass right. that particular day was the only day i never drove the sled and the reason part of the reason again i was trying to take weight out of the sled and michael was 70 pounds lighter than me so it was i was looking for the weight advantage right and uh, and so did michael know at the end of that pass did he know 
or did he have to circle back around to find out that he broke the record? So, so he had to circle back around to know what he did. I'm sure he knew. He knew it was good. Right. Um, and to describe how that day went, you know, the the year before that, the 192.2, I drove that, and that was the winning speed of that day. Um, and then when it came to the the year that we did the 203, that was also at the Canada versus the World event. And so I started off tuning where I had left off at 192.2 with me driving it. So when Michael went on it, it actually went 193. So I said, ah, so it is faster because he's lighter. Yeah. And so when he came back, now at, at that point, 193 is new world record. Nobody would ever been that fast before. So he came back. So I said to him after all the kind of pictures and stuff, I, uh, I asked him, I said, well, Michael, so how'd that feel? Um, how's 193? He said, yeah, he says, that felt real good. He says, it's nothing to drive it. It's nice and straight, doesn't do anything weird. I said, so do you want to go faster? He says, sure. He says, that felt real good. He says, it's we went to, to drive work. it. It's nice and straight, doesn't do anything weird. And turned it up a little bit. I said, oh. And the next pass, it went 197. Well, it's a new world record again. So they take a bunch of pictures and stuff. And walking back, um, uh, Michael's dad, my best friend, Doug, he says, that, that sled's now ready to go 200 mile an hour. And I said, I know it is. He says, well, why don't we do it? I said, OK. I said, well, let's ask Michael. He's the one driving it. So I go over and I said, Michael, I said, what do you think about going 200 mile an hour? Yeah, he says, sure, I'm ready. He says, sled's ready. He says, it, it's nice and straight. Doesn't it's, it's beautiful to drive. Anyway, the next pass, he went to 203. And then after all the pictures, and that was, that was a pretty big deal for us. Um, my buddy's kind of greedy. And he says, that sled will go 210. <laughs> and I said, I know. Well, he says, why don't we do it? I said, well, let's ask Michael. So I go over and I, I asked Michael, I said, well, Michael, I said, how'd that feel? Do you, have you had enough or do you want to go, do you want to go 210? He says, oh no. He says, I've had enough. He oh, says, really? pretty fast. <laughs> and that's what stopped us right there. And it's probably good judgment that, that we did. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't want to push it. Didn't want to push his luck too much. Yeah. Hmm. Pretty crazy. I'm having some technical difficulties here, I guess. So, um, just bear with me here. I'm trying to get uh, trying to get this thing to reload up, but it's not uh, doing it. So just hold on a second here. I'm going to refresh okay. it again. See what's going on. It's probably past the computer's bedtime, maybe. <laughs> Still have audio, but I have no video. I see the video small. Nothing. Yeah, dark it, look, it looks like I just came back in there, but I don't. Uh, You're not in the main one. No. Uh, just bear with me a second here. Yeah, and there's like three other screens tooling around there. I'm going to try standard definition and see what happens. Just give it a few seconds to catch up. And refresh it again. I'll probably leave again, but it should let me back in. Anyway, we'll see what happens there. This this probably will be a last resort for me to get my camera working again. It's not really a camera issue per se. I can see it's working. But I'm still not back online. That's weird. Yeah. Very strange. I don't know what's going on. Sorry about this, guys. Like, uh, 
I'm glad I got my audio on another system, but I don't know what it's going to mean for the the whole stream feed. Well, it'll probably show up just just like what we're seeing now. You just won't be on the bigger, uh, well, it's in the not. bigger box, right? Yeah, I'm getting a. Uh, if you can see this, you're getting like a uh, six frames. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And even it the big box like that to... is just spinning. Yeah. yeah, this was only in the, the last ten minutes or so, though. Gary, it wasn't like this the whole time. Yeah, weird, weird. Okay, but that. Uh... That's a shame. Maybe, uh, yeah, they all see the same as what I'm looking at. It's just the black boxes. And try and reload it again. I don't know what it would be. It's not, uh, it's not an internet thing, I don't think. Or because I'd have no audio then. Yeah, it's most likely something to do with the, uh, the streaming service there. Yeah, I think it is. And it's been crashing a lot lately. It's not, uh, it's not what it used to be, that's for sure. I think I'm going to have to kick this old school for future shows because I can't have this happening. Um, it also means that Dave's hiding behind the trees. <laughs> I it does. That. It does. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. There we go. <laughs> my wife, my daughter loves a real Christmas tree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hold on, I just want to see if this comes back now. Um, sorry about the delay on this one, guys. Yeah, it's still not looking like it's doing anything. Weird. Keep it like this, he says. Why, they must Definitely. be able to see it. It's better this way, for sure. The boxes are bigger. I'm still not seeing... That's what I'm seeing as what's on YouTube right now. Yeah, no, that's that's what we're yeah. seeing too. But, it's but when you it is before, better. Before, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, hold on. Dave's a not hiding. He's not hiding behind the trees anymore. Yeah. No, no, that's good. Okay, hold on a second here. All right. Okay, let me get this back here and see see if we can get it back. There. Yeah, I'm still not. Uh... Okay, we can still see the little picture there. That's that's better. I don't know what yeah. the three boxes are above. It's kind of odd, but um, there we go. You're shaking his hand. Yeah. That's part of the celebration, really, at the time, eh? Yeah, like it must be a good a Yeah, yeah. Very cool. This is Michael getting ready to go. No, sorry. This is him just coming back. Right on. He's on the trailer there, being towed yeah. in there. Yeah. I don't know for sure at that particular moment if he actually knew what happened. Really? This is a cool picture. Um, like I said, everybody came. Well, from left, I'll see if I can remember everybody. Uh, from left to right. So I said my pastor went. Well, the pa my pastor's wife is the one on the left. Um, ah. I'm an automotive technician by trade, and my mentor over those years is the second one from the left. His name's Gary Tracy. He's the one I modeled myself after when I was in the automotive trade. Nice. Manda that worked for us. Manda's husband. Um, Bart behind uh, so Bart's the fourth one. My daughter Dora is the fifth. Ryan worked for us is the sixth. My wife is the seventh. Michael that drove it back row the eighth. Um, um, oh, I just drew a blank. Oh, Nikki, um, Claude's wife, right up front, and I am not hundred percent positive who's right behind her. Um, then me, then Claude, my best friend's wife is uh, next to Claude, Justin up front, and my best friend uh, behind his wife, or beside his wife, and the pastor is the one on the far right. 
That's cool. special when you, everybody came and it was cool. It was like Talk your wedding. A community support, eh? Yeah, that's cool. This and that's one, all you got is a little plaque. You didn't get like a, a purse with like 50 grand in it or. I got something even more important than the plaque, to be honest. I don't know if we have a picture of it, but I won't tell you just yet until we get through another picture. But the plaques were important. We honestly, Claude, over the years of doing it, Claude, he, he asked me about, you know, maybe giving away a purse, giving money. And I said, well, don't, don't do that for me. Um, I'll take the $3 plaques anytime because you can't afford me. Um, if I got to start coming for money, I spent a fortune of this. Anyway, I, in my old shop, I have all them plaques. They're all along the, the ceiling, along the walls. Uh, it's kind of my story, you know, as it developed over the years, start to finish. Anyway, those are the plaques we got that day. Right on. This picture is my favorite. Um, this picture is tells the story. Uh, you can see me pushing the sled on the handlebars and yep. my best friend, Doug, pushing it from the back bumper. You, If you notice the expression on our faces, we, we're both the old guys now and we got that little grin on our face. We know exactly what we're about to do. And, and we're all walking up to the OK Corral together, kind of thing at the starting line, ready to get it done. And everybody's kind of there in that picture. I have that all blown up into a poster, and that's the end of my plaques, that picture. Yeah, Elaine nice. sure, your wife, Elaine, sure looks like she means business there. That's, oh. her, <laughs> that's her on the left, eh? Yeah. 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 She, yeah, she that's sure her game does. face. Yeah, game yeah. She's yeah. ready. <laughs> yeah. I see you You have H1 on this one, and there was another snowmobile with H2 on it. Uh, are they yeah. significant of anything? So H1 was the first, the first one built. H2 was the second one built. There's actually an H3. That's the Pro Mod. So the H2 is the summer one. H1 is the winter one. Nice. I had to put the picture or the I had to put those numbers on for the drag strips actually. This is really? Michael driving the sled. Somebody snapped a picture of him just leaving the starting line. What's he got? Is that the, the normal back that's on there, or what does he have on the back of it? Of the sled? Yeah. Yeah. Is that is that the way it just maybe it's just the way the sun's reflecting? Almost yeah. looks like there's, a, there's another box on there. I think it is the way the sun reflects it. Yeah. Um, it's just the back of his seat, really. And then we kind of kept it going toward the back of the sled just for aerodynamics, really. That's where that parachute went inside of. Oh, that's right, too. Yeah. Look at the ice flying out the back of this thing. So I would say that by there, the turbo had spooled. Uh, it's probably 500 horsepower or something right there. Um, really starting to take off. And you can sort of see the front ski starting to, it's light, but it's, it's still floating. on the ground. Yeah. Starting to spit out chunks of ice out the back. Uh, and, you know, radar running is not all about putting the power to it from the start to the finish. It's There's a finesse to it. I don't know why I can't learn that at the drag strips, but um, you give it power. You got to have a lot of power, but you ramp it up through the run. It goes, it, you turn it up and up. It's like, tr like a train. It just keeps pulling harder and harder and harder all the way to the end. Yeah, that would be fun. Do you know how many G's it actually pulls? Never measured it. I, I do remember, though, one of the runs, oh, some years before um, before that day, uh, I remember it. I had good traction, 
and I had tried some different clutch stuff and it pulled so hard in the mid range. I remember thinking to myself, holy crap, that feels good. <laughs> and I always like that kind of feeling. Yeah, I think that would be that would be the addiction, right? Yeah. Yeah. Untreatable. <laughs> <laughs> Treatable with more of it, you said. Yeah. Another well, one there's a prescription. Out. A prescription. Just, yeah. just the right amount. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just a picture from the radar runs of her buddies. I think that's Dora, actually. Oh, that's neat. Yeah. Anything ever go in? Doing that. Does it, anything ever go in the uh, the stack? I don't. Do you have no, any debris or anything? No, I don't think I ever remember anything happening like that uh, for the radar runs. Um, you know, when we're drag racing, we use the stacks, but we'll put a filter on the front of it. Make sure. I mean, you don't always finish first, so. If we're behind somebody, we have to worry about that. So the, actually, a company makes a great big, huge filter to go in front of that uh, velocity stack like that. So you still get to keep the velocity stack, but you don't have to worry about anything going in. Right on. Yeah. Here, I'm just trying to change something here with uh, with this to see if I can get this to go. Bear with me a second. I'm going to be gone, but I should be coming back and hopefully it fix the problem. I'm, I'm, I've been on phone with, uh, with uh, tech support while we've been streaming here. <laughs> There's you two. There's me. All right. I don't know what, what it's done yet, but it didn't look like it fixed it. So anyway, that's the end of the, uh, the photos anyway. So. I'll put myself back in here. But yeah, that was pretty cool. Thank you so much for that. Well, it's like a, you know, the front of my trailer, uh, I have a saying and uh, the saying says live in the dream. And yeah. honestly, I feel like I've done that. Uh, what a ride. Um, couldn't ask for a better life than, than the life I've lived so far, and I'm not done yet. So that's awesome. kind, of, kind of like going back in time, talking all, a lot about, about a lot of memories, really. When yeah, you uh, cool. when you were talking about selling your those first few pieces, um, I'm assuming you had a full time job at that time. I well, yeah. Yeah. Um, like I said, I'm a licensed automotive technician, licensed truck and coach technician. Um, I had an automotive shop of my own. Okay. Um, so I had that shop for 24 years and through the years, uh, well, my first wife and I actually were together when we started that shop and then the marriage didn't last, but our friendship did. And uh, we we ran that shop for the 24 years together, even after we were divorced. Oh, really? Cool. Yeah. But then Hurricane Performance was growing so big that I, I kind of saw that I wanted to do Hurricane Performance full time. And I, I gave her three years notice before we actually div like part of company that way. OK. And uh, and, uh, you know, the very next year, Hurricane Performance doubled in size because we, we were able to focus on it. Awesome. Yeah. That's sweet. I, I don't know how well it's going to look, but you want to give us a shop tour? Oh, yeah. So uh, let me see here. Uh-oh. No. Nope. Yeah, your phone came out of the your phone came out of the uh, the uh, stream of, a while ago, and I think, like, among other things, like that. that's... Uh, I don't oh, think I'm going to do that. We so lost your sound there, Gary. Gary, we can't hear you. We can't hear you.
We lost your audio. Still nothing. Dave, are you? Are you? Are you yeah, there? I can hear you, Vince. Yeah, can you hear me, all right? So we're good, but we can't hear Gary. <laughs> and I'm no lip reader. Are you a lip reader? No, no, not very, not very good. He's messing with it technically, trying to get the picture yeah. back. I think, and somehow he must have hit something. Are you able to uh, log back in on your phone, Dave, to, to do the tour? I'm afraid not. My battery's dead. <laughs> okay. Sounds like it's working. All right. All right. There, we are. Music. Music. There, there, there we are. There we are. No, I, that was me. <laughs> what yeah. a night. If, if people want to get a hold of you, Dave, where, where can they find you? Where can they follow you? So, so um, Hurricane Performance Canada, Inc., is our company Facebook page. And generally yeah. speaking, um, most of my online communication is done there. Um, so anybody that wants to watch us and follow us, go there, Hurricane Performance Canada Inc. Facebook. Right on. Um, and and I answer messenger um, messages and, and stuff like that. Obviously our email, is uh, Dave at hurricaneperformance.ca. Um, we get a lot of emails all the time. And collectively, as a group here, as our team, we'll answer the emails. Um, a lot of it I answer personally. The um, we, we get about 200 calls a day this time of year now in our at our company. And uh, so probably calling isn't the most ideal way of getting a hold of me because, well, the phone's always in my ear. So <laughs> texting me and my my cell number is 613-803-5956 uh, and you're welcome to text me, anybody. Um, right on. Perfect. Yeah, you've been- So really, I guess I'm reachable. You've been really using it a whole. And, and Vince, yourself, uh, where can where can we find you on the socials? Beaver Tail Toys, uh, YouTube number one for sure, and then yeah, Facebook, Instagram, um, it's all the same the same handle. Beaver Tail Toys. Right on. Well, thank you for co-hosting tonight, Vince. You did a terrific job. I apologize for the technological problems there, and thank you, Dave Marshall, for your time tonight. I really appreciated the insight, the stories, and and the photos you, sh you shared with us tonight. Thank you. It's been a great pleasure. Really good seeing you again, Vince. And Same. I'd love it if you'd call me. We get that update to 100%. you. And get that whenever you're ready. Yep. Yeah. A little, a little sidebar, kind of a, a funny thing. I was on the phone maybe, I don't know, it was the beginning of summer, maybe two months ago for a different update with Dave. Unfortunately, in my house, it's only Apple products. Um, <laughs> so the, the software that Dave uses to log in wasn't compatible with Apple. So I got to borrow a, a PC or windows oh, PC yes. to, yeah. to get the, the next update done. So, but yeah. that's no big deal. Nice. Nice. <laughs> Renegade X says, thanks for a good show, boys. Bruce Stewart says, great show. Uh, it goes on and on and on. So that's, that's awesome. So thank great. you again. And, and I look forward to seeing at the trade shows and, and so forth. And if I can find a, Four stroke turbo, I might see you someday, Dave Marshall. Well, you make sure if you're in my neck, neck of the woods, you gotta you gotta stop in and see us. That'd be and, awesome. Uh, to everybody too that's watching. Um anybody can stop in. We'd love to see you stop in, and see us. Say hello. Yeah, yeah. We'll and, have to and get and you back on. Gary, we'll get you back on and do a uh do a shop tour. All right again. And Gary, I, I got an open invite for you to come and try my mock anytime. You I love have that. the keys. You have the keys, my friend. I'd love that. No, and, yeah. and definitely I want to ride. Corey and I have talked about it as well. 
we want to ride with you and your wife and, and yeah, yeah, for sure. And get out this year. And, and maybe it is around the family day weekend, a couple of days before, if we get up there early, that kind of thing or whatever. So, yeah. you know, that my, my wife and I are building a pretty unique, uh, Airbnb that's going to be snowmobile friendly, um, on, on the French river. So maybe, maybe we'll make something happen there where you and the boys can stay maybe one night or something like that. So oh, I'd love that. That would be awesome. Yeah. Keep me, yeah. tell me in on the details of that as you get them. That's, that's yeah. very cool. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Oh, that's cool. Well, thank you guys. I'm going to run the credits now and, uh, and we'll go from there. If you want to hang out afterwards and chat off the, off the air a bit, we can do that. But uh, yeah, let me just roll the credits here and then we'll, uh, we'll call it a night. And thank awesome. you again for hanging out there. It's been a long, it's been a long three hour show. So that's a, it's a good one. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Thanks for having us. For having me. Cheers. It's a journey for